Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Tabor? Here. Uh, this is to close the non-public session and seal the minutes. Are you in favor? Uh, yes. Okay. Councillor Denton? Yes. Councillor Moreau? Yes. Councillor Bagley? Yes. Councillor Lombardi? Yes. Councillor Blaylock? Yes. Councillor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Unanimous. And now uh, we will open uh, Monday, January 9th, uh, City Council meeting. Uh, start with a roll call. Mayor McEachran? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councillor Tabor? Here. Councillor Denton? Here. Councillor Moreau? Here. Councillor Bagley? Here. Councillor Lombardi? Here. Councillor Blaylock? Here. Councillor Cook? Here. Great. Um, this was a, uh, a tough uh, few weeks for Portsmouth. I know that there's uh, many out there that have lost somebody. Um, I wanted just uh, as a moment of silence, uh, Dwayne Foster, um, as well as uh, Jeff Clark, uh, who passed away on uh, Saturday. Um, that might be news to, to some uh, of you tonight, um, but he passed away on, on Saturday. I would ask that you, you keep Martha uh, in your thoughts and a moment of silence. Please join me uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, there are no uh, meeting minutes uh, to Except here, and I was seeing uh, if I had my comments on the um, on the winners of the holidays lights contest, and I don't, so I'm gonna have to wing it. Um, I got some notes here, but I had printed out some uh, some longer comments, so we'll see how I do uh, on the fly. Um, first, um, I would just want to thank uh, the citywide neighborhood committee uh, for all the work. Uh, that went into not only the judging uh, of this, but getting folks uh, to sign up. Um, my uh, wife and our two daughters, uh, we took that map uh, one night and uh, we drove around town. It's about two hours or so of, <laughs> of driving. I will say that is the limit for our, our, our youngest. Um, but luckily, um, as we passed Al Bailey's house, we, we saw the, the glow of the golden arches uh, and we pulled into uh, McDonald's and we got a Frosty there. So all's well that ends well uh, there. But it was amazing to see um, just how many people uh, signed up for that. Um, the effort that goes in by the Citywide Neighborhood Committee every year uh, to do this uh, is remarkable. Um, and it brings... Uh, uh, a lot of holiday cheer um, when you know it's it gets dark at 4:30. So um, very uh, appreciative of the citywide neighborhood committee. I also wanted to just call out again um, our sponsors, um, uh, Jay and Amanda McSherry of the J Group. Uh, $500 to their restaurants is a, is a big deal. Um, you know that is uh, it can be used at any number uh, of their their restaurants. Um, Ed Hayes uh, coming through with $500 at, uh, at Reese's. Um, again, you'd be surprised what you can find in Reese's. Uh, it's, not just, uh, it's not just flooring. Pretty much anything uh, that you need and appreciate his commitment to the community as long, along with uh, Market Basket, uh, Hannaford's, and McKinnon's that made it possible to, uh, to offer not only a third prize of $500, uh, but ten twenty-five dollar gift cards. So, a big thanks uh, to 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 everyone um, that participated. Now, I'd like to go through um, the. And I, do we have the? We do. We have. Um, all right. So they're in. Okay, they are in order. Thank do we have uh, 
Uh, John uh, Chavez here. We do. All right. He's wearing a festive. So John won uh, uh, best traditional round of applause for John. Um, we have uh, the most creative with Matt and Nicole Beyer, or Matt and Nicole here. Right here. All right. And is, um, is Ray Clausen here with the, the Kids' Choice? All right. So how awesome is that? Is everyone showing up now. You know, um, we have um, another um, uh, special uh, recognition um, for, uh, for Al Bailey um, for his years of contribution uh, to the Holiday Lights concert uh, contest. Is Al here tonight? He is. All right, Al. Yeah. So next year we're going to name one of these awards after you, uh, Al. Uh, but I have a special mayor's award uh, for you um, here. It's a uh, it's a proclamation. I'm sure will go in a place of prominence. We also have a uh, we don't have a key to the city because we're the city of the open door, uh, but we had some door stoppers made. So it's the, the, it's the city of the open door door stopper uh, for uh, your 36 years of commitment. Um, and then we also have some um, honorable mentions that I think are named or not no, named? They're not there. Not named. Well, they are here. They are here. Are <laughs> all right. <laughs> this is what I'm basically a guy with a teleprompter. Sorry. If I don't. <laughs> the highlighted ones are supposed to be here. Okay. Busy. Okay. So, um, Lindsay, are you here? They are. All right. Um, Cindy Ward. And, uh, and Molly Shaw Wilson. All right. Okay. Well, if everybody would come up, I um, would love to just grab a, a photo um, and pass out the awards. And we will, for the folks that weren't able to show on the honorable mentions, we'll mail these to you um, if you're watching at home. So, um, can we come up? Do you need help? Uh, I think we're. I okay, think we're that's, good. That's Al's bag. Yeah, Al's bag. Yeah. Okay. All right. Al's All right. Bag. Come on up here, guys. If <laughs> we could just grab picture. a picture. I think we have some. We have Stephanie here to take a picture. That's awesome. Stephanie's so good at it. <laughs> She's ready on cue. Okay. Stephanie, can you take a picture? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I did. But being his yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but what is happening here? Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, yeah. It's like that's my restaurant and it's yeah. a we'll get gold you back. ornament. It's pretty cool. It's not That'd in a good cool. place for you, is he? He'll get over there. Yeah, rile him up. I know. You need to get him that photo. <laughs> That's a nice fact. <laughs> Will you leave it? <laughs> now you do not have to stay after don't feel like you got to stick around unless you do want to talk about one of our 
public hearings. But next up, we have a presentation uh, by Rotary Pass President Ben Wheeler. Thank you. Uh, before I get started, I just want to point out a few little trinkets that we dropped off in front of each of your chairs. Uh, there's a wine glass for the Portsmouth Rotary 100 year um, birthday celebration, and there is the one of a kind uh, Christmas ornament. Richard, this may be awkward, but it is the ferry landing, so we hope you enjoy it. If you don't, please take it up with your fellow silly city council member. Uh, with me tonight are a bunch of Rotarians, but also our club president, Joni Dickinson, and President, uh, are you president elect? Yeah, yeah. President elect Yvonne Legg to help me out. With so, as I said, my name is Ben Wheeler. I'm a past president, <coughs> proud member of the Portsmouth Rotary Club, which is the one that meets at lunch. For those of you that don't know, uh, I want to thank you, City Manager, uh, Mr. Mayor, and distinguished members of the City Council, to allow myself and my fellow Rotarians to stand before you today in the spirit of giving. Uh, I'm not someone, I'm not paying attention to this timer thing over here, nope. so just so you know. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to, so Perfect. That's, that's good. Perfect. I'm not someone who believes in once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. I think that we're all better than that. I think that uh, sometimes when an opportunity in life passes you by, when you're surrounded with like-minded people and you have hard work and dedication, that opportunity will come your way again. However, I, I couldn't be more wrong in this particular situation. I think that in this case, this really is a once in a lifetime opportunity, which means that just putting your best foot forward isn't gonna be enough. Never again will the city of Portsmouth turn 400 years old at the same time as the Portsmouth Rotary Club turns 100. Over a year ago, we formed a committee of past, present, and future leaders of the Portsmouth Rotary Club. We were comprised of over 30 years of historical and club leadership. Our task was simple. It was to identify the appropriate way to say thank you to the greater Portsmouth community for our 100 years of history. Now, I don't know if anybody in this room can sympathize with this, but sometimes it's hard to get work done when everybody in the room is a type A personality <laughs> and they think they're the smartest person in town. <laughs> <laughs> However, as evidenced by me standing before you today, we persevered. <laughs> as we celebrate our histories, we're provided with an opportunity to pay homage to those who came before us and the hard work that these people did to make the city of Portsmouth the great place it is and the hard work that went into making our Portsmouth Rotary Club the great club that it is. However, we need to recognize that this work wasn't done in silos. It was done in collaboration. Through collaboration, the City of Portsmouth, our local nonprofits, members of our community, and the Portsmouth Rotary Club have accomplished great things together. It was collaboration with the Portsmouth Rotary Club and the City of Portsmouth that the city's first recycling program started. Every year, there's a chess program that goes out to every fourth grader in the City of Portsmouth where they teach these kids how to play chess, but they also teach them the consequences of good and bad decisions in life. These kids gain courage and they go home and most importantly, that chess set ends up in the living room where the TV gets shuts off, shut off and family members sit and learn how to play chess together. It was the collaborating efforts that led Dorothy Vaughn to come to our Portsmouth Rotary Club singing to the ceiling the importance of recognizing the cultural and economic benefit of preserving history. Our club turns 100 years old this year, and we have so much history to be proud of that was done by those who came before us. We stand before you tonight with an eye towards the future, promising to our children that tomorrow will be better than today. But if that's true, if that's truly true, it's the work we're doing right now that matters most. And I stand before you today and say that as our club turns 100, right now we give this to the community of Portsmouth. Wow. Nice. Oh.
This is $100,000 to the greater community of Portsmouth. And here's what we're going to do with it. Through collaboration, we've partnered with the Portsmouth Women's City Club, and we have done a substantial renovation project at their facility located on Middle Road, hand in hand with their members. We've partnered with the Society of Protection for the New Hampshire Forests down at Cary Cottage, where, where we're going to help build a freestanding structure directly adjacent to the Education Center that will now have an outdoor bathroom facility for hikers and walkers. We've partnered with the folks at the Portsmouth Community Garden where we've helped build and donate a shed so that these folks with their green thumbs can help reduce their carbon footprint. In a nod to our maritime history, we're working with the Piscataqua Youth Sailing Association who supports the Portsmouth High School sailing team. Through this partnership, Rotary is helping this organization purchase eight used 420 sailboats from the Navy. Now as to why we're all here tonight. About a year ago, I reached out to city manager and to Peter Rice in an effort to help identify some projects that Rotary could partner with the city on. They brought to our attention that the city of Portsmouth plans to plant 400 trees during the 400 year of celebration in a nod to the history. We'd like to pay for 100 of those trees in a nod to ours. We ask that somewhere in this area where these trees are planted, there be a plaque adorned that recognizes the years of dedication and service to our Portsmouth Rotary Club and to the greater Portsmouth community on behalf of Basil and Louise Richardson. We've also liked to partner with the city as the city plans to do updates, making playgrounds more inclusive throughout the city. An inclusive playground is an open space designed to promote play among children of different ages, abilities, and communities. In total, our gift to you will be $30,000. On behalf of the Portsmouth Rotary Club, I'd like to thank you, Madam City Manager, and Peter Rice for helping to identify these projects we can collaborate on in an effort to celebrate our history, helping fulfill the promise to our children that tomorrow will be better than today. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it's great to see you uh, with your family uh, there and setting an example of, of what the future holds. Uh, it's bright if people are willing to build it uh, and make it a little brighter. Uh, thank you so much for your commitment uh, to Portsmouth. Um, your words, uh, but also the actions uh, that go along with those words uh, to make sure the impact is is there. Uh, Portsmouth thanks you uh, for this generous donation uh, and look forward to working with you and Rotary for another hundred years. Thank you so much. Honor, if I might, um, Councillor Tabor and I are both proud Rotarians, so uh, we're really proud of the turnout tonight. I see many, many Rotarians and we're very grateful. Thank you. I, I've been lucky enough to go to a couple lunches there. Pretty good lunch um, <laughs> and always a great conversation and never easy questions. So I uh, appreciate uh, the Rotarians that, that showed up here tonight. Next up, we have a, a recognition of uh, Dave, Dave Lovely is our 2022, and is the presentation going to go on that? Or? Nope. Okay. Uh, Dave Lovely has been selected as 2022 EPA Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant Operator of the Year Award. Dave, are you here? He is. Yes. All right. Can't have the best uh, the best uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant without the best plant operator. So thank you so much, Dave, for your commitment. We are 
so happy to see this recognized um, on behalf of the EPA. We join them in celebrating uh, all of the tireless hard work that goes into, into this uh, and appreciate that, that we have the best, um, best in Portsmouth. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. And uh, not to be outdone uh, in the inspection department, uh, recognition of Timothy Metivier uh, selected as the 2022 New Hampshire Code Official of the Year. Timothy, are you here? <clears throat> Thank you. If you'd like to say a few words, I should have offered the opportunity to Dave, but if you'd like a, a few words, feel free. I could say a few words, a few words. Um, no, I, I appreciate the honor. It was a little unexpected. Uh, my colleagues voted that as a, it's very prestigious. There's not many people of the year in the, our field, um, but it was, it was quite an honor and I appreciate your applause. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more awards to give out, so it, it seems everyone else is here for public comment. Um, we have a lot of sign-ups for the McIntyre. Um, that has its own public hearing, so I would ask, um, I'm going to go through uh, all of the um, non-McIntyre on the public comment, which is limited. Um, if you would still like to speak, I would just ask you to speak at, at public comment. Um, we'll go for uh, three rounds, um, uh, three minutes, five minutes, and then on the third bite of the apple, an unlimited amount of time uh, to speak on that. Um, but I'll go through first with uh, folks that are, are coming to speak on other matters uh, with the three minute time limit. First up is Barry Heckler on the topic of uh, TCL uh, 64 Vaughn. Thank you. Before the timer starts, I brought a handout for uh, oh, Mayor and the distinguished members of City Council. We can't hear you. If you could just speak into the microphone a little bit. This one? Yep. You just have to pull it up towards you a little bit. Okay. The head. Is that just better? the head? Is that better? Yep. Better? Yep. I think so. Can you guys hear him in the back? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, distinguished members of City Council, my name is Barry Heckler. I'm president of the Board of Directors of the Provident Condominium Association, HOA. And I've been asked to speak on their behalf in opposition to the third request for a temporary construction lease license uh, for parking in the alleyway for the 64 Vaughan Street project. The first request uh, resulted in 14 parking spaces in the Worth <coughs> from March 5 to February, June 3, 2022. Second request resulted in 10 parking spaces in the Worth lot from June to, I'm sorry, uh, June 3 to January 1, 2023. None of those requests referenced parking in the alley or a safety buffer like the third request does. The third request is four parking spaces in the alley as a safety buffer. It's not a safety buffer, it's a convenience. There are six parking spaces in the alley that grants access to the Worth lot from Hanover Street and is the only access from and into the garage for the owners of 25 Maplewood. 
nine residential, two corporate. That garage provides parking for 20 vehicles. When the contractors park along the construction fence in the alley, it makes ingress, egress to that garage perilous. It's a safety feature, it's a safety hazard, and it's been going on for months. They've been parking there for free during the work hours, Monday through Friday, and the public parks after work hours for free, and all day and all night, Saturday and Sunday. In the handout you just received, is a memorandum setting forth in detail the reasons that we object for safety reasons. There are six photographs that will tell you everything you need to know about what the safety feature is. You'll see one of them with a truck that blocks the open door ingress egress to that garage. You'll see two more where they're parked along there. Sometimes they move the fence into the alley which further encumbers traffic. The public speeds up and down because they don't want to get caught in the one lane. That creates yet another hazard for the public as well as the owners. We're not opposed to construction. We're opposed to having ingress, egress become a safety problem. And we're asking city council, if you grant the, the uh, license, which we hope you do, but with the proviso that there be no alley parking or encroachment or encumbrance of that alley in any way due to construction. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, next up, we have Marks from Elliott, Exeter, uh, Francis uh, Cormier on the subject or topic of Simon Says. I thought I was number 10. You are, but there's a lot of McIntyre, and then there's some folks that live outside of Portsmouth, so we're going to get through the non-McIntyre first. Francis Cormier, Melbourne Street, Portsmouth. If you are over 50 years old, you may remember a childhood game called Simon Says. <coughs> Simon was an imaginary king who couldn't make up his mind about anything. Here we are 50 years later and we're still playing Simon Says in the political theater of the absurd. Here are some examples. Simon Says, you must believe in science. Simon Says, now fire all the scientists that disagree with me. Simon Says, Antifa is just an idea. Simon Says, so when they burnt down neighborhoods in Seattle, it was all in your imagination. Simon Says, only a fool could think the election was stolen, Simon says. Now spend four years trying to prove the election was stolen from Hillary Clinton. Simon says, only a fool could think 110,000 dead people voted in Wisconsin. Simon says, I do, I do, I do believe in spooks. Simon says, separation of church and state, Simon says, now do as I say, because God talks to me. Simon says, God wants us to be compassionate and open our borders to the entire world. Simon says, now send all the Cubans back because they know communism doesn't work. Simon says, fly an airplane into a building, then you'll go to heaven and get 70 virgins. Simon says, too bad, your 70 virgins come with padlocked, cast iron chastity belts. Simon says, banning books is the work of right-wing kooks. Simon says, now ban the Dr. Zeus books because the little Elfkins are white supremacists. Simon says, restrictive gun laws help fight terrorism. Simon says, now leave behind $80 billion worth of guns, tanks, and bazookas for the terrorists in Afghanistan. Simon says, the First Amendment is necessary for a free society. Wait a minute, get rid of the First Amendment before someone exposes my corruption. Whoops, I forgot to say Simon says. Thank you, Francis. Uh, next up is... Uh, Paige Trace with the subject of Portsmouth. Good 
evening, Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Here's the riddle. What, sorry, it won't, Daglin. Can we have a start over, please? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Here's the riddle. What can't you get by wearing your finest or by accepting stuff? Is it appropriate or simply disrespectful? Not giving it can be called poor judgment. Regardless of the circumstances, in celebration, wearing a top hat indoors in a place of worship, a house of God, is disrespectful and inappropriate. You were elected. You set the example. Your poor judgment to some was your choice to wear your top hats in a dreadfully wrong location. You were guests in a house of worship, and the three of you appeared to be blissfully ignorant of it. Great example, counselors. Ignorance is not an excuse for an elected official. The mayor gets it. Sadly, you don't. Counselor Andrew Bagley and Counselor Kate Cook. Vibrancy, vitality, make it pretty. 75% of the storefronts downtown are merchants, true fact. What do you think this town would look like if they all closed from lack of business? That's really vibrant, isn't it? Really pretty. Maybe you should think of that while you're busy not caring about keeping the parking in front of merchants. They depend on it. Our parking belongs to everyone. Councillor Bagley, ah, but here's some good news for you. There's still likely to be a free meal out there for a while. How inappropriate is it for a city councilor or those running for council to take a free meal and drink from a restaurant or bar, as you admitted to me in front of witnesses? There's take, that's taking a gift, Councillor Bagley. When you take that gift for free, you place yourself under perceived obligation to the giver. Clubs, expensive private clubs, are no exception. In answer to you, ask first. On every vote involving restaurants, I believe you now have a conflict of interest. Ke Assistant Mayor Kelly and Councillor Blaylock, you both own food and beverage establishments. You're conflicted. Your own votes tonight affect the profits of your businesses. Remember the words of Robert Sullivan. Does it put money in your pocket? Take it out, real or literal. For all of you, ignorance is not an excuse. The answer is respect. You earn it. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. All right, guys. Um, next up is Mark Brighton. Um, I wanted, I think this is gutter dining? Yes. It is, okay. <laughs> gutter dining at its best. Mark Brighton. Uh, South Mill Street. Is, in terms of gutter dining, who is directly affected by the uh, thousand car per day restriction? Obviously not those on, uh, on the sidewalk directly. Jumpin' Jays, Thirsty Moose, Goat, Clipper, definitely, because I understand, according to rumor, they are not the flavor of the month at, the, at City Hall. Where are you, Councillor Denton? There you are. Councillor Denton, uh, you want to give reduced rates for those who uh, compost, those restaurants that will compost. Is Fox the only game in town, <coughs> or effectively the only game in town? And uh, do you now or have you in the past had a business relationship with Fox? Will you vote or will you recu recuse? doesn't matter because it will still go 8-zip. Assistant Mayor Kelly, you will directly benefit this time. That isn't even a question. Will you vote or will you recuse? It'll still go 7-zip. Now we're back to you, Councilor Bagley. How many restaurants are you still getting free meals from? It, I mean, maybe they give you a pass, maybe they do not. But it is the perception 
of, there's that word perception again. It is the perception that you may still be getting a free meal that should really be bothering you. No problem, though. If you recuse, it'll still go sick zip. But then we finally we get down to uh, Councilor Blaylock because you also benefit. But maybe it'll go just five zip. Thank you, Mark. All right, guys. The Eric Anderson, do you want to speak uh, just on fees and hold the McIntyre stuff till the uh, public hearing? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council. My name is Eric Anderson, 38 George's Terrace, Portsmouth. Um, I'm here to comment. I'm a little confused the way the agenda is assembled because um, under um, uh, under uh, Council Bagley and Council Cook's discussion on a sample motion for outside dining for the 200, 2023 season, it, it, I'm, I'm not sure if the way the motion is constructed, if they are going to make the motion, if it's going to be final policy if that motion is passed, and is there going to be any public hearing on that motion if it is passed, since it has some financial implications to it. Um, I'm not going to comment on the structure of the motion except for item E, uh, which called, <laughs> brought out my attention at least from some, some perception um, that, um, and uh, as it reads, it says restaurants requesting a parking loading zone encumbrance can receive up to a $500 reduction if they compost food waste. For sidewalk spaces, that there would be a $200 reduction. I, I think it's beyond the, the, the responsibility of the council to to offer these financial carrots, um, you know, for restaurants. I think it uh, it, it 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 also encompasses an administrative burden to the city to see who's going to police this. Um, I, I, I don't have any, like I said, I don't have any particular qualms with the fees that you've come up with. I'm just, I'm just very concerned that the policy of this council is going to be, if this motion proceeds to some type of final effect, that, that it's providing financial incentives that I think is beyond the duty and the responsibility of the council or the city. And I, you know, with regards to um, it's with no malice, but I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this vote goes because I think there could be some recusals, um, you know, appropriate recusals for the, for the monetary consequences if this motion goes forward. I'm still a little confused if the motion goes forward, does it go to the next extent of any type of public hearings? The agenda does not discuss that, and I think it's a concern that you should all have to see provision E in this uh, restaurant policy for 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next up uh, on the outdoor dining program, Kevin Dwyer. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Kevin Dwyer. I'm a resident and native here uh, at 461 Middle Street in Portsmouth. Uh, I also own Dwyer's Pub at 96 Bridge Street in Portsmouth, and I'm here to talk about the city's outdoor dining program. Uh, my, my business turned three years old last month, which never would have happened if outdoor dining, if the program hadn't taken place during the height of COVID. And I'm always grateful to the city uh, for making this happen. Uh, the, the program has been a silver lining, I, th I think, of the pandemic, and I ask that the council consider a few factors going forward from the perspective of a business owner. Um, last year, the square footage rate was set at $5 per square foot for patios that don't use parking spaces, including my own, uh, which has been recommended to double in price this year. Uh, I, I agree with the idea that having businesses pay a fair amount encourages us to feel like we have stake in the game and more to risk uh, if we don't do the best with our patios. However, I would like to know the purpose uh, or to know if the purpose of the program is to generate revenue or create vibrant outdoor spaces in the city, which most residents and guests in the town desire. Uh, realistically, and especially for small business owners like myself, an increase in the rates actually takes away from the money that we can put towards increasing the quality of our patios. Uh, there's a wide range of businesses in Portsmouth with 
very different levels of resources, and to double the square footage fee hits the smaller businesses more profoundly. In the instance of my patio, we don't take up any parking spaces and have less impact on traffic flow. If the rate doubles, I may not be able to afford the program. And as everybody knows, rents are already high in Portsmouth, and the increase, an increase of this magnitude makes the already high cost of space even higher for business owners. Uh, my patio affects traffic flow in a lower traffic area just outside of downtown. If my patio's, per if my patio's parameters by square foot were, say, 20 feet by 60 feet versus 20 feet by 1 foot, the effect on traffic would be the same. However, the wider I make the patio, the more expensive it quickly becomes. Um, the city does not lose revenue with, pat with patios in my category, so I ask that the council consider whether the current rate is fair and what the purpose behind raising it would be. Uh, the increased revenue is much less impactful to the city's budget than it is to an individual small business. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your, uh, your communication with the business community on this. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, the uh, Petra Huda on the budget department and outdoor dining. Good evening, Council, Mayor, Petra Huda, 280 South Street. Uh, the first thing I want to ask for clarification on the uh, measure that Councillor Tabor has on the table. <coughs> it reads, move to report back on preliminary 2024 trends, major budget drivers, potential tax impacts, and city manager guidelines at the January 25th Council meeting. My ask for clarification is, is he asking for a report here for all of these issues, or is he asking the, the city manager for guidelines on the budget? And since I have my handy dandy city charter here, um, basically um, this is one of the duties of the city council to set the guidelines for the budget. And the city manager enforces that policy. So I would really like to know if this is a full motion, what it encompasses. Uh, the next thing is outdoor dining. Um, as you would recall, or I did as I looked it up today, in your meeting of February 22nd, 2022, um, the last statement was that outdoor, this would be the last year for outdoor dining on any roads. Um, it appears that you're making an exception, and that exception only covers one industry here. Um, please keep in mind on all of this, we have more downtown than restaurants. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have hairdressers, we have jewelers, we have everybody that needs parking. The parking that this will take up again. That's one side. The other side is the revenue that this would generate. Last year, the city manager was very cordially provided guidance to this council. The guidance was that to recoup the amount that would be needed for a parking space that should be charged to each restaurant encumbering that space was $5,700. This council took it down to $1,500. That's a difference of $4,200 on each space. My calculations last year, somewhere around $342,000. This year, we're doing the same thing. So I guess I would ask, there's no COVID. Most of the restaurants received PPP funds, Main Street funds, to the tune of about, about $25 million. Now, <coughs> This benefits only a, a small part of the population. I asked you to consider all of the rest of us in this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Joni Dickinson. Joni, on the subject of Rotary, are you still here? Nope. nope. Um, uh, Esther. <coughs> 
Kennedy on the topic of uh, dumping and outdoor dining. Mr. Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. And um, I request the city to get be up front and open about all the places that we have dumped or that we have made deals during previous city councils, even 25 years ago, um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. We have an issue that I think I'm hearing everyone tonight and we're talking about all these little issues, but I think you have the front of the view, the biggest issue that'll get bigger, Banfield Road. So I ask that we as residents deserve to know, we know on Jones Ave, we have a major dumping area we, that has been considered close to Coakley there's a lot of dumping areas in this city that deals were made with the federal government and with other entities. Morona Road. So I ask that you all um, let your citizens know where these dumps are so that we can be open and transparent. And we start talking about how we are going to come up with the potential millions for lawsuits. And I'll be honest with you, the rest of the stuff tonight is pretty small, I believe, to, in compared to that. Outdoor dining, I ask you to be smart about outdoor dining. Think about it. I've been up here before asking you to consider everyone. Consider all those small businesses. Consider the rainy days when no one's really around, yet maybe a local resident will run into a shoe store and pick up some shoes if they can park right up front and quickly run in or they'll run into a stationary store to pick up some stationary if they can park out front and run right in. I really think that in many cases, our outdoor dining um, was great. I voted for it during a time of need. However, we're not in that time of need any longer. And there are some other things we could probably look at and get creative if restaurants need to come up with a plan but I ask you to consider every entity downtown. And I saw this and I was kind of shocked that if we're talking about fees, how come it's not going to the fees committee? We have a process and a protocol here, folks, and I would encourage you to follow it. Um, so as you're thinking about downing, dining, outdoor dining, I really would hope you think about all residents and what, the, what shutting down parking spots will do for those other entities and those other commercial um, places that some of us might just want to pop into. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, next up, we have all right, um, Chris Kraft, you here? No, I think you left. Uh, Rachel Henderson? Nope, okay. We're going to go back to the um, uh, Mark Brenner from Elliott on Prescott Park, etc. Good evening, everybody. I'm sure you missed me since the last uh, time I was here, October 3rd, I think it was. All right, so any, most residents do not know about Prescott Park. They really don't. I've talked to many, many people. Even people here in the room, they have no idea that you're transforming Prescott Park into something different. And this was a five-year project, that, well, it was five years ago when they put it together. The, it was 15 to $17 million then, and it's probably <coughs> $50 million today. Who the hell knows? All right, um, you're starting phase one in the spring, and you're moving that Shaw building to the street instead of raising it, which would be much less money. Then they, you say you have no money to fix the building up. Now, where did all the money go? I mean, is there something that taxpayers should know? Maybe that is why you are taking the independents away from the auditors and adding three of you to that committee that you formed. Am I not right? Oh, you don't answer me. I forgot that's right. All right, anyway, I think that uh, a, a nice way to uh, get the word out is to send it out with the spring taxes. Everybody would know and explain what's going on in the city. 
how you're transforming that park, taking down the trees, getting rid of the parking lot, moving the flowers, all right? Making the whole thing different. And people need to know this, and they don't. <coughs> Why? So my suggestion is send it out with the tax bills. All right. All right, Mayor, you ceremoniously put the pride flag up in June next to the American flag and the state flag of New Hampshire. I don't think you should have done that. I mean, only 3% of the population belongs to that pride flag. So it stood there for June, July, and half of August. I would like you to let me put my historical flags up there this coming June, July, and August. I've got two beautiful historical flags I can put up, and I'd love you to do it. And if you want to do it ceremoniously like you did, great. But that's what I'm asking from you. All right, what else? All right, the Black Lives Matter over at uh, 244 Marcy Street that's painted on the wall there in a historic district violating some of the laws. And it's still there. And Ms. Cook, I brought this up last time, and it's still there. How come? It's your neighborhood. You walk by it every day. OK. The other thing I want to talk about is that we each get three minutes. But yet, you set aside 45 minutes for us, the public, to speak. Well, if five people come up for three minutes, that's 15 minutes. There's still a half hour left. I mean, you guys all make enough money. In fact, I, th I never knew you guys made 50 grand a piece. And I know what you make too, Mayor. I never knew this. I thought this was like uh, public that, service, yeah. you know? It's, it's news to me as well. Yeah. <laughs> Look it up. When did we get the check? Yeah. You didn't get the check yet? I didn't get the check. I Thank thought you. you were all making money. Thank you, Mark. It, it's right there on, on Google. Okay. Uh, next. So the rest are McIntyre um, speakers. Um, we're going to move to the public. Let's see. Um, yeah, I would just uh, can, I'd wait a motion just to pull up C so we can just get through. So moved. So moved. Uh, so suspend the rules and pull up public hearing C, um, known as the McIntyre Federal Building public hearing. So moved. Second. Uh, and we'll have a roll call vote. Sorry. <coughs> Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylaw? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Unanimous. <coughs> um, so we'll start with the uh, public hearing adoption of resolution authorizing a supplement of appropriation from the unassigned fund balance for the design and engineering of alternate plans for the redevelopment of the McIntyre Federal Building surrounding property. City Council has determined the sum of $150,000 uh, is to be appropriated from unassigned fund balance to defray the expenditures for the design and engineering of alternative plans for the redevelopment of the McIntyre Federal Building and surrounding property of the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2023. Um, the city manager will um, add to this. City Council will have questions. And then I'm just going to go through the list of names and call you up to speak on this. Um, you didn't have to sign up to speak on this. Um, but since you did, I'm going to use this order first for the first three minutes. And then everybody, if you want to continue to speak, uh, you'll get five minutes of the second um, and then an unlimited amount of time. So um, listen to the city manager. We'll hear questions, and then we'll, we'll start with uh, Gerald Duffy is the first uh, sign up. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I will be brief, but for those at home who do not have the benefit of the packet, I will read from the packet and just share some, some brief thoughts. <coughs> As a reminder, in April 2022, the city in Sobo Square, LLC, executed a settlement agreement that resolved a lawsuit brought by Sobo against the city related to the McIntyre Project. Over the last seven months, the city, Sobo, its partners, 
completed a design for what is commonly referred to as the community plan. The preliminary cost estimates for construction of this plan have varied widely. As discussed at our December 5th Council meeting, the City did request and was granted an extension of our license with the General Services Administration for the McIntyre Building and for the submission of our application to the National Park Service for an additional 90 days or till March 31st, 2023. During this next three months, the City will be engaging in discussions and negotiations with SOBO regarding the design, the division of capital and contributions to the project, the division of the expected revenue return, and other pending elements. Specifically, we plan to take the next 90 days to contract with financial real estate consultants and an expert construction cost estimator to evaluate the information that we have to date. And um, I'm looking to see if the city attorney would like to add anything before we turn it back over to you, Mayor. Um, I would simply add that um, operating under this settlement agreement is um, part of a um, litigation risk for the city in terms of how we operate under the settlement agreement, whether we comply with that agreement, et cetera. And that's the reason why the city councilors really can't speak too much to that because it is involved in um, potential litigation. Well, um, with that, um, if, are there any questions? I'll pass it up to the um, the public hearing, starting with uh, Gerald Duffy. Are you with us? Yeah. All right, remember, three minutes first time, five minutes, then unlimited. So I, I, Mr. Mayor, I made a note that by, um, I'm probably gonna need more than three minutes, so can I wait till the second round? Is that the best way to do that? If you wanna say that you're gonna just come up and speak, so we have you in the record of sure. you're gonna plan to speak at the second round. So, uh, Gerald Duffy, uh, 428 Pleasant Street. Um, my comments will probably exceed three minutes, so I will come back when you call for second speakers. All right, uh, Christina Lesky. I'm Christina Lesky, 94 Odeon Point Road, Portsmouth. When considering appropriating up to an additional $150,000 in expenses for the McIntyre project. Please do not spend one penny more than necessary. So much has already been spent on this over the years. This council has, up to now, not made the taxpayer a high priority. This must change. You must also not keep residents in the dark about McIntyre financing. Likewise, when negotiating with the developer about the amount of the city's financial contribution to this undertaking, bear in mind that we're dealing with inflation, a volatile stock market, a possible upcoming recession, and revaluations in another 18 to 24 months. Do not negotiate out of desperation, even though there is a tight deadline. The mayor may have been on to something when he stated in an interview that reducing the size of the project could lower costs. <laughs> I would add that simplifying the design could also help. Hopefully, the architects could at least attempt these modifications to the plan in the time allotted by the extension. In your zeal to complete the McIntyre application, don't lose sight of the long-term consequences. Do not become the city council that makes the city of Portsmouth permanently unaffordable for the middle class due to high taxation. Do not sacrifice the Portsmouth taxpayer on the altar of the McIntyre development. Thank you, Christina. Next up is Sue Paladora on the first three minutes. Sue Paladora, Middle Street. Um, 
Every time I read an article <coughs> about McIntyre, about what the city is on the hook for, I get reminded when I was really young, I bought this car. And a month later, at about five or six hundred dollars worth of repair later, I realized that I had bought a lemon. I think we have a lemon, and we cannot make lemonade out of this one. We can't make lemonade out of this one. The more I read about it, the costs are going to double. You remember the big dig in Boston years and years ago? was originally estimated at $4 billion, ended up costing over $21 billion. Nothing that has to do with government is usually within budget. This is just going to be the beginning of $100,000 more, $200,000 more. When is it going to stop? I think that we, uh, the, the intent of the previous council, when they terminated this lease, when they terminated the contract before, was the right thing to do, and I still believe it. The more I read about what's going on, the more I believe it. So this is going to be a mess, and the people are already tired of hearing about McIntyre. Believe me, we have PTSD about McIntyre. <laughs> and you're going to hear about it more. Something is going to happen. Something is going to break. Uh, this. Uh, Kane is, is not turning out to be a really good partner for this project. I would prefer just to open up the postal, service, postal office again and shut everything else down. I don't care about the building, just let it rot. We'll have an open space right there, green space. Let's have a park instead of housing that nobody's going to be able to afford. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Let's see, um, Bill, we'll come back to you, Elliot. Um, next up is uh, Mitch uh, Schildman. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mitch Schildman. I live at 620 Lincoln Avenue. <clears throat> About 10 years ago, I was the chairman of the school board here in town and worked very closely with Mayor Farini and the whole school board to convince the community that it was important and worth the effort to renovate the old middle school and build a new addition on Parrott Avenue. That cost about $40 million. It was a project worth the investment with benefits that we see to this day. We spent hours and hours in public <coughs> meetings explaining to people why we thought this was the right way to go. I haven't heard anyone say we shouldn't have spent the money. I know what it's like to ask my friends and neighbors for a boatload of money, but the McIntyre debacle is a whole different kettle of fish. 75 to $150 million for what? So a real estate investment company, one, by the way, who, th who has threatened to sue the city and has already been paid $2 million, can make an adequate profit in my wildest dreams, I can't imagine why you would want to continue to do business with a company that has threatened to sue you. They have already left a bad taste in my mouth, and I don't even know them. The first city council that dealt with this issue foisted an end-of-term agreement on all of us. That didn't taste very good either. All but one was booted out of office. Hubris was the word I heard many people say at the time. The next city council had no tact, no good sense, and zero diplomatic skills. They created a very antagonistic relationship with the developer and sent us, set us on a path towards being sued in court. This city council has had the good sense to begin to settle this issue. It has already cost us $2 million, and I understand why, and you did the right thing. Yet I'm sorry to say I don't have any faith that you can necessarily do any better. For whatever reason, the Portsmouth City Council has proven over the past few election cycles that it is incapable of handling this type of large public-private partnership. I say, let it go. I'm done with this project. There isn't anything on the table that I think is worth 70 to $150 million. My opinion is short and not so sweet. Figure out a way to carve out a bit of property for a city green space park and then unload the rest. Let it be developed by the private sector, but in the process, 
keep a watchful oversight and make sure you hold them to all and every city regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> Next up, uh, Eric, if you'd like to speak on the McIntyre. Eric Anderson. Again, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Eric Anderson, 38 George's Terrace. I'm not going to speak with some of the eloquence that's going to come forward to you this evening on this particular <coughs> issue, but, it's t but it's, it, 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 I think it's time for um, uh, some um, transparency in this. I, I was disappointed with the explanation from the city attorney that we still have, if I heard correctly, that we still have litigative issues that have, are under consideration after paying $2 million to settle the first debacle. So I mean, why, why the silence on this with the, ta with, the, with the obligation to the taxpayers potentially are gonna be put on the hook for that this issue doesn't have some um, transparency? I think that's what everybody's desiring here is what's under the table that people just don't know about. When people don't know, they get fearful. And that's just not right. I think it's your obligation to be as, as forthcoming with every aspect of this particular subject so that people can see it in the light of day that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Next up, uh, Jim Lee. Mr. Mayor, Councilors. So each week I get from Marion Webster, the dictionary people, a little known word, your used word, and the definition of that word and the use of that word in a sentence. Last week's word was boondoggle. <laughs> a boondoggle, according to Merriam Webster, is a wasteful or impractical project or activity often involving graft. The use of that word in a sentence is the project is a complete boondoggle over budget, behind schedule, and unnecessary. <coughs> As a bonus, I guess, they have an intransitive word here for a person that participates in a boondoggle. They're called boondogglers. So <laughs> that's my summation of the McIntyre project. Thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Susan Denenberg. Susan, are you here? Thank you. I'm Susan Denenberg, 44 Wybird Street. Appreciate your being here to listen. We all know there's no such thing as a free lunch. But for some reason, I think people haven't understood there's no such thing as getting a building for a dollar. That's what was promised to us, and that hasn't happened. <coughs> There's been a lot of history here, which I think you know pretty well. Other people will remind you of it. But having made this settlement for $2 million to get out of a lawsuit that you probably could have done better with in court is concerning to me and to a lot of the public here, too. Um, in addition to the $2 million, I understand from reading the paper that you're on the hook for other payments um, that are incurred by third parties as well in the future with amounts that are unknown. Now before you, you is a request for another $150,000. I've said before, and I'll say it again, this is not a good project for the city. The developer has different goals than the city does. I think it is a situation where we have irreconcilable differences, and we should get out before we go any further here. This partnership has no benefit to the city. When people were asked, they wanted the post office to come back. The post office isn't coming back under this scheme of things because they built in the back so much, you could never get a truck in there to even deliver the mail to the building. The developer seems to have a default of saying, if I don't get what I want, I'm gonna sue you. And we're maybe back to that again. I would urge you to stop squandering the taxpayer's money and put an end to this project. 
It hasn't been a useful project. It's not a desirable for anyone in the city. I would suggest that you vote no on this expenditure and sever your ties with the developer. We don't want to become partners with somebody who we can't trust. I'm also somewhat concerned if there's any city councilors who had, were given money by the developer, whether wittingly or unwittingly, if that might have happened through a, a political action committee. And if that's the case, anyone who took money from a developer should not be voting on this. My understanding is that the Attorney General's office is still looking into some shenanigans that happened at the last council election. And I would simply ask that you consider that this is not a worthwhile project and you should not approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Next up is Peter Somsich. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor uh, and City Council. Peter Somsich, 34 Sweat Avenue. Um, I, too, would like to second the, the idea of not approving this money until we have more transparency about the whole project. Uh, what I read so far about our current <coughs> status is that we have a design that's been agreed to, but that the financials have not yet been agreed to. So I, for one, would like to see that design because when we went through the long process of public input, there were some things that were clearly the opinion of the public at the time. We wanted a, a project that had a, the post office, a complete post office there. We wanted a project that included a lot of green space. And uh, through another survey that was done at the time, people agreed that we're, the public should be willing to pay something of taxpayer money so that we have a say in this project and how it's done. And that's why the community plan was such a popular choice. And if you recall, uh, Michael Kane and his company said that project is unbuildable. So here we are talking about a design that's been completed where Mr. Kane had said he can't build it. So I'd like to see that design. And of course, I'd like to see the financials later on as well. But it seems to me there's a, a, a dissonance here between the developer's intentions and what the community said they wanted. Now, the, the, the legal opinion we just heard is that some of the things that we as the public want to hear, you can't tell us because of the settlement. So if this settlement basically uh, hamstrings you into talking and being transparent about this project, then there's something inherently wrong about the settlement. That, that is not in the best interest of the public. And if you recall, the first Michael Kane project that was proposed was rejected by the General uh, Services Administration, among other things, for not being uh, providing GNU, GNU, uh, not providing enough public benefit. So I'd like to see a whole lot more transparency <coughs> and a whole lot more design and what you've agreed to so far before we approve any more money in this whole issue. And. Um, uh, I really think that the, the cost of the project doesn't scare me as much. I think this should be a public, public project that the public supports. It's an important project for the city of Portsmouth. But what's more important than the, the total budget of what it will cost us is how much of that will the developer pay, how much will we have to pay, and what kind of revenues can we expect back? Those are the considerations we have to make before we just discard the whole project as such. So I ask you not to approve any more money until we have more transparency. And I'd like to see that design right now to show me that it is like the community plan that people wanted. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, next up is Roy Helsel on the subject of McIntyre. Evening, Roy Helsel, 777 Middle Road. Good evening, I say again. But I think that as once we paid $2 million to this organization that's supposed to be a partner 
And I always thought partners were 50-50 on everything. It seems like they demand what they want, and we get nothing except higher taxes out of this. I know that one time that the consul cut the bands with them, and I don't see why we don't use Bingin. He is a, a developer that said he would take care of everything that the people wanted, and he would have the green space, and you people took back our developer that does not become a partner. They demand too much, and that's not a partnership. So I think you should cut it down, and the $2 million, what did you pay for? That we could have something that we want. But it's still, they want everything, and they give nothing. So that's not a partnership. Remember that. Next up is Steve uh, Barndor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my wife, I am 120 Ridges Court in Portsmouth. Uh, uh, we've been supporters, my wife and myself, at, at, <coughs> from the beginning of the McIntyre project. I ran for the city council uh, unsuccessfully, uh, I guess it's now with f almost four, three and a half years ago, and one of my uh, planks was really McIntyre and what a bad agreement it was with the developer at that time, primarily looking at the land lease and the cost. Um, I, I take my hat off to developers in town and, and elsewhere, but here, who um, come before the city boards, who go out with their financing, borrow from their banks, leverage themselves, and come in with come up with good projects and adhere to the uh, to the designs that they said they were going to build. Uh, numerous examples: Eric Schimberg's projects downtown, Mark McNabb. Like it if you don't like it. I I understand huge building. And these guys go out. Here we have a partner, uh, in, I don't know if Mr. Kane is here tonight or not, uh, right from the beginning that I find they have been mean-spirited. Uh, he has added nothing when asked to speak at Project Head as his developer, Sobo, and he's collected $2 million for uh, legal blackmail in, in my book. Um, I, I think you should vote against uh, spending any more money. Uh, any amount of money. We spent $75,000 plus on the principal group, came up with numerous designs, the same people and, and others, uh, hundreds of people went to those uh, workshops and spent a lot of time coming up with what was a reasonable plan. So I, don't, I, I think the, the ground lease, uh, I don't even, we don't even know, <coughs> uh, as you just mentioned, what you've agreed to, but uh, for a start, have we agreed uh, with him with Kane in writing for $2 million that he isn't going to bring a lawsuit again? Is there a disclosure that he has uh, ultimately agreed not to, attest to bring a lawsuit against the city again? You don't know. So uh, Mr. Binney uh, and, and others, but Binney particularly, have, stepped, have shown us that they were willing to build it uh, out of their own pocket money. Uh, there was the threefold time the lease uh, agreed to or talked about at that time was $300,000 as opposed to the paltry figure of $100,000 that the original agreement with Cain was. So I would strongly uh, urge you and uh, uh, to vote against this and not spend any more money at this time. Thank you, Steve. Next up we have, um, we'll go back uh, to Bill Hamilton. We will get to them in a second. All Thank right. you. <clears throat> Bill Hamilton, Elliott, Maine, former downtown business owner in Portsmouth for 42 years. And I promise you that I did not collude with the prior speaker. <laughs> I had written this previously. The McIntyre Project is a boondoggle. <laughs> Wikipedia. De defines boondoggle as, quote, <coughs> a project that is considered a waste of both time and money, yet is often continued due to extraneous policy or political motivations. The situation can be allowed to continue for what seems like unreasonably long periods, as senior management are often reluctant 
to admit that they, are, they allowed a failed project to go on for so long. In many cases, the actual project itself may eventually work, but not well enough to ever recoup its development costs. That's Wikipedia. Merriam-Webster, as my former speaker mentioned, defines boondoggle, again, as a wasteful or impractical project or activity, often involving graft. And the Oxford English Dictionary calls it, quote, an unnecessary and expensive piece of work, especially one that is paid for by the public. The original idea for the McIntyre was for the city to receive the building and its land for a dollar from the General Services Administration through the National Park Service, not specifically for its commercial or development value, but as a public benefit for the people of Portsmouth, a requirement of the National Park Service for turning over the property in the first place. Then the city decided to enter into a public-private partnership where the developer would assume all costs of development and the city would pay nothing but and lease the property to the developer again for the benefit of the public. The developer's initial plan was rejected by the National Park Service for, among other things, the developer's excessive profit margin. When the city rightly balked and changed course, the developer threatened to sue the city. Then the city reached an ill-advised settlement agreement with the developer, not only paying the developer $2 million for the rejected plan, but also guaranteeing the developer future and exclusive development rights to this very same project. So here we are today with a city on the hook for millions of additional taxpayer dollars for a period, for, I'm sorry, for a project with minimal public benefit, but a guaranteed rate of return for the developer. If this is not a boondoggle, I don't know what is. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Next up is Marie Bodie. Via Zoom. Hello. Members of the committee, excuse me, my is my audio working? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I previously signed up to be on this call for an event that is happening on a professional matter, but I want to divert this conversation as a personal resident of 121 State Street and a former employee of the Peace Development Authority. And hearing what is happening with this McIntyre project, I would like to commend that last speaker because I did work for the Peace Development Authority in the 1990s when we had a um, $1 transference of the Peas trade port to the state of New Hampshire. And there is a um, unusual circumstance that is happening with the developer Kane and the city at this point in juncture with guaranteed revenues and my employment at the PDA was in the, again, 1990s, when the most extreme <coughs> property um, with the most visibility at the trade port was leasing for $25,000 an acre. Here we are with the McIntyre project in the center of town. The developer is certainly um, gaining all of this income stream, guaranteed revenue. I, as a resident, um, don't support it. Of course, I work for a developer. So I have um, a convergence of opinions and I didn't intend to speak on this matter tonight. Um, with all due respect, Mayor Declan, I was trying to, uh, McEachern, excuse me, I was trying to speak previously on also the outside dining. So um, I just, support that a lot of the folks that I've listened to tonight as a resident from downtown Portsmouth um, against the McIntyre project and against um, the, or in support of the lawsuits and all of these things, <clears throat> I don't believe that we have a partner. And that is me, Marie Bodie, not an employee of McGap Properties, so I'm sorry. Thank you, Marie. Sheridan Lloyd. 
Next up, Sheridan Lloyd, and then we'll go to anybody that wants to speak for the first time from the audience that didn't sign up. Good evening. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I've learned a lot from many of the other speakers uh, having to do with McIntyre. A lot of things have been going on somewhat <coughs> behind the scenes, involved early on, and it's just been incredibly difficult to understand and the level of stress that's been involved in what's being developed in the McIntyre project. So I will speak about what I originally thought of about the McIntyre project. Um, I do know there's huge amounts of money involved, and I think that's a problem for the city of Portsmouth. But I will uh, read off what I was originally saying. I still believe in the fact that the McIntyre property is a legacy project for the city of Portsmouth. In 10, 20, or 50 years from now, the residents and visitors should be able to enjoy the city-owned property and have it be the draw downtown for our community. In future years, people will say, this is great. I'm so glad the city and people of Portsmouth had the foresight to make the space happen for all to enjoy, for the benefit of the residents and for everyone. Some other examples, look at Wagon Hill Farm in Durham. That's a successful legacy project that residents of Durham and the whole seacoast enjoy because of the foresight of Durham government and the residents of Durham. Another example is the Rose Kennedy Greenway in Boston. I agree with Peter and have heard many more about the problems with this project. We need to make a statement legacy that city owned and its public community plan project for the benefit of the residents. Redgate Kane is not interested in the details and the requirements of the benefits of the public. The McIntyre project overall, I think, is a good idea, but I think we have an issue with Redgate Kane and Sobo. I think we're being strangled and potentially killed by them. They are not a partner. There are other options. I believe the overall project is good, but I don't think Redgate Kane Sobo has our best interest. Thank you. Thank you, Sheridan. Okay, uh, there's speakers on Zoom, but there's speakers that have uh, stood up, so we'll go back. Um, again, first time speakers, if you can, uh, you don't have to line up all of you at, right now, but we're gonna go with Paige uh, first. I just wanna sense, so then we can go back to the, the uh, when I don't see anybody stand up there, I'm gonna go back to the Zoom. For those on the Zoom. All right. Mr. Mayor, Page Trace, 27 Hancock <coughs> Like another speaker earlier, I respectfully ask to be able to speak at five minutes, not three. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, Bill Downey, 67 Bow Street. Uh, I think a lot of people are really underinformed and misinformed. And as I've said from the get-go, you've all heard me say this a number of times, this has been a corrupted process from the day one. People think that the city's gonna have to split 50% of the cost. Now, most of you know that's not accurate. What I'm calling for, Mayor, is action that merits and reflects your rhetoric. Rhetorically, you've said you want inclusion, participation, that's what democracy requires, but what we've been experiencing this whole process pretty much has been close to authoritarianism. We have very little participation. It's very linear in thought. The notion that you can't share information because there's a potential lawsuit is borderline insulting to me. I think it's nonsensical. It's been used a number of times over the, over the history of Portsmouth. You know, as Dick Bagley said many times, you gotta stop hiding behind that shield of a potential lawsuit. Now, if things go sideways down the road, sure, but there's no pending lawsuit. You guys sign your, that agreement in April. You know how I felt about that. That's why we brought the lawsuit. That's where we are. What I'm suggesting now is looking at options beyond that. You know, Bill Binney's still in the wings. The city never had the decency to acknowledge his bid. He's still out there. The benefits over 75 years 
would eclipse, there's not gonna be any benefit. You know, the, the contract that says it has to be 92% occupancy before we see any money, we're not gonna see any money, it's just gonna cost, cost, cost. But before we go anywhere, Mayor, I would ask you to introduce a public forum. So the team, the project team, could ask questions to the city manager, the city attorney, and the rest of the team. People are in the dark. That's not democracy. So are we gonna be an inclusionary city, or are we gonna be more linear and dark? Because that's where we are right now. And I know you have the burden to make this work, but no money should be approved until there's complete transparency. We need a full accounting, whether it be legal or financial. And if you don't do that, you're complicit in an authoritative rule. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Mark Brighton, South Mill Street. Other than the dirty, rotten tricks of Steve Marshand, and did I just say that they were terrible and awful? But in case I didn't, I'll say it again. Terrible, awful tricks of Steve Marshand. This council, the prior council got flipped because they couldn't close the deal on McIntyre. And believe me, if you folks don't close the deal on McIntyre, the city manager will have to be put on a suicide watch because she loves this council. I mean, absolutely loves this council because they do whatever she wants. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Patricia Bagley, 213 Pleasant. Um, don't really have any notes. Um, I was expecting a presentation. I was expecting city councilors to ask questions. That's what the agenda said. But it's another public hearing where we have to come and guess and say a lot of <coughs> things that probably don't make any sense to any of you because we don't have the information. And um, I feel as though I should apologize for that, but it's not really my fault. Um, as far as the appropriation, I would ask you to not vote for it. Um, you've asked to hear from the public, and you are certainly hearing from the public. I, I can't agree to, to wanting to spend more money on something I don't even know about. What I do know is that, as I said probably four or five years ago, the project, as best I can tell, offers us everything we don't need and nothing we do. Do we really need 45 apartments at market rate? Do we need another dozen retail spaces? And we're paying for that. And you're paying for that. And even if you don't own a home and you're renting it, the cost will be passed down to you by the person who owns your property. We're all going to be paying for this. And we get no, no information. I didn't expect a reading from what I had already read five times to try to get some glimmer of information. There's nothing. It's really disappointing. Um, I would be happy to pay off this developer um, because I think he's acting in bad faith. I'd rather we just kept the building as is, we can hire someone to redevelop it, and there's parking already there. We don't need what's in this project, and we certainly don't need the dishonesty, which is what lack of transparency is. It's not being honest. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Good evening. Peter Harris. 249 Islington Street. I appreciate hearing all the other residents' voices tonight on the McIntyre. This past year, the residents, the voices of the residents have not been heard when it comes to this project. Residents are not being updated on the work and changes being planned. I feel the council has provided zero tr transparency in the McIntyre process this past year. The meetings, if any, were closed to the public not open, not an open door. Any and all meetings on this issue need to be open to the public. We deserve this. 
The McIntyre is a gift to Portsmouth and residents and not the developers. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Nancy Brown, live on Busy Bartlett Street. Busy Bartlett. And um, there's so many things that people said that I agree with. But the things that come to me and what I believe in is that as citizens, we truly have a voice in this and we need to be listened to. And what I've come up with is um, that I think it's <coughs> time as citizens and the developers that we compromise, that we figure out a way to compromise and get this done and do it. And consider the compromising. Do not ask for any more money, developers. You've got enough. You're, you know, and tell us why you need any more money. And punish us for put, putting this aside for a while. Let's truly focus on what the problem is. Let's come together, look at the real issues, look, and include, uh, as my scribbled notes are, private and public coming together, compromising, and get this done. You know, we don't need any more overdevelopment in Portsmouth. When I tell people I'm coming here, they say, why do you even waste your time? Look at what's happened to Portsmouth in the last two decades or the last 10 years especially. Every time you get the Portsmouth Herald, they have a front page at least twice a week of a two more million dollar houses being sold. That's not who we are, you know? So please, let's consider compromising you can do that, the developers can do that, and let's get this done. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> Dick Bagley, 213 Pleasant Street. Uh, just an observation, obviously, um, we're in a legal situation, as the city attorney commented on the very beginning. Highly unusual, given the emotion that's behind this whole issue, that we would start off with a city attorney telling us that even though we paid $2 million, we're really th threatened every day, and we have to therefore conduct ourselves in private without transparency to the public because we could get another lawsuit. So basically, uh, we are back where we started, and that's legally where you are. So it's great to say I'd like to have grass instead of a built-out site that's 99% built out with a thousand retail establishments when we have vacancies in the town as it is, but that's not legal. That's not the position that we're in. So as much as we would like to change it, we can't. And I think what would have been more appropriate tonight that you let off saying we need $150,000 if you look at the plans that are out there, there's demolition plans. Is it the $150,000 because there's demolition going on that's marked? What is, what is the cost? Why is there a cost overrun? There will be. There will continue to be cost overruns. And you've set a new precedent now of telling us we can't know, city attorney, because we could get sued. I think what you've heard tonight, and I'm saying this, Mr. Mayor, a little bit tongue in cheek. We're going to hear from a speaker who wants five minutes, who had a guest uh, piece in the Portsmouth Herald. Peter Somsitz wrote once and had his editor of John Tabor's Portsmouth Herald to be what used to be edited. And that's what we as citizens go through, but there seems to be a connectivity. And as Mr. Duffy says, the reality in the, our, our amendments is you can kind of say what you want, and people might believe it or they might not. Mr. Duffy keeps talking about the Beckstead Five. And remember, they made the right decision that you overturned. I'd love Mr. Tabor to instruct his paper to start now talking about the Boondoggle Nine. <laughs> Little tongue in cheek there, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dick. I can't follow that. <laughs> Petra Hoda, 280 South Street. I'm requesting to speak in the five minute period. Thank you. I um, actually know how to do boondoggle, and I feel like I should make keychains for you all out of my boondoggle with some of my students. So maybe that'll be something down the road. Um, I just ask that I liked what Miss Nancy Brown said. We need to get this project done. But with that, we need to have common sense. We have a citizen's plan, and I've seen some rendering sunset citizen's plan that aren't really a citizen's plan anymore. And I don't know who's involved. Um, I don't know um, what money got transpired or if money got transpired or trans transferred between entities. I don't know how much involvement the city management has. I would have to question that with the entities that we're talking about. But the bottom line is we ask for open space. We ask for citizen space. We ask for a place where we could have a place to meet. That was one of the decisions. People came together and created a plan. And when I go online, it's not the same plan. So why have we changed? I think you need to look inside yourselves and say to yourself, what are you gonna do for Portsmouth here? I know I made a decision and I decided that maybe this developer wasn't the right developer to make that, that do that job. You guys decide this is the right developer. So how come we're still spending money? I would ask that you create a budget, you show the citizens a budget, and Attorney Merrill, I'm assuming that is not against turning client privileges, and that you share what this project really is gonna be. We have a Saturday event, or we have an evening event. And what, how are we gonna move forward on this? You chose to go with this developer. So tell us the story. And I know we don't give out keys anymore, but I hope, Mayor, you'll put a doorstop in and open the door so that we can all see the project. That's what these citizens are asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. <laughs> Any other first time speakers? We'll go to Zalita Morgan. Hi, can I, can I um, speak at the five minute speakers uh, at that turn, please? Sure. Thank you. Next up, Peter Whalen, last speaker of the three minute first time speakers. Yeah, thanks Mr. Mayor and uh, city councilors. Um, I'm just gonna relay something to you. I, since I was the one who made the motion to fire this, uh, this developer, I'm just gonna read you that motion. Uh, this was back December two years ago. I said the tonight the city is at a crossroads Redgate Kane two weeks before the election, restarted a lawsuit against the city of Portsmouth and its residents. Totally political and meant to influence an election. The McIntyre subcommittee has been negotiation, negotiating and moving a project forward. Despite threats and character attacks against the subcommittee, I've been silent trying to protect the citizens' interests. With over 50 meetings, I am silent no more. It's time to take action. And with that, I made the motion to terminate the agreement and to go out with an RFP to get a new developer. And this council has decided to keep this developer. And you're at a point now where you have no ground lease, you have no development agreement, you have a very poorly written settlement agreement that gives the city no outs. 
and there's no transparency. You have a certain person who's been writing columns in the Portsmouth Herald, and what you're going to get from this developer is a bait and switch. He's going to go back with his old project. And that's really, I don't know, I, I'm speechless. This, this property belongs to the residents and citizens of Portsmouth. It doesn't belong to Michael Kane. So I would urge you tonight not to vote for the $150,000 and start some transparency. Let's look at the ground lease. Let's look at the development agreement. Let's bring it all out in the open. I had 50 meetings. And I could tell you, after those 50 meetings, Daglin and, and John Tabor, I mean, I can't believe that we're still dealing with the Kane Company and what's been going on. You paid them $2 million. We're nowhere. It's time to end it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. All right, uh, second time speakers. <coughs> you just have to come up when you're ready to speak. Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. You have a vote tonight and its size requires public opinion by a hearing. With due respect, you haven't even shared enough information for anyone to make an informed opinion. Where's the financial pro forma? The development agreement, the draft form of the ground lease. Is this project viable without undue cost to the resident? Who provided Sobo Square's three figures in the discussion of cost? Do any of you know enough to decide without the financial pro forma? Or are you just spending more of our money because the city manager believes you should? You may have outsourced this project to the city manager, but you shoulder the responsibility. What happens if you decide the developer's original plan is to be built? Do we get the two million back? How much will Portsmouth have to pay for all the improvements all said and done? You're proposing $150,000 to offset the cost of alternative design. What are you implying? More new plans? More old plans? What next? How far can the manipulation go on before residents notice? When do residents realize the similarity is in name only? The community plan is the will and the collaboration of the people. The plan now appears to have greater mass, more height, less green space, a higher, narrower atrium roof, and lots of concrete. Where's the will of the residents? In fact, the buildings look suspiciously in size and height, like the developer's two original buildings, A and B, now on an angle. The roof between them starting now at three stories, way up where no one will see it. So after a certain columnist has been busy assuring everyone with their opinion that to speak against this outlay of money would bring certain marginalization to the speaker. I say no. Please vote no. The plan of Carlisle Capital had greater relevance to the people. It was free. The pro forma would be different now, but at least refer to it. It was the vision of a smart man and his dedicated team. Residents wanted the post office back. They wanted public green space and a project built green, Councillor Denton. He recognized that. The plan also had an awareness of Portsmouth's transportation issues and our parking. And something very refreshing to all residents, 
a green park, rather than unaffordable luxury apartments. We need more housing, but not our money spent towards benefiting the wealthy. No matter why you chose to run, all of you, it's best to respect all who put you up there. Your vote is yours, but you make it on behalf of others. By the way, once again, where is the financial pro forma? It's likely the National Park Service and GSA will want to see it. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Other second time speakers? Thank you, Eric Anderson, 38 Georges Terrace. I'll be brief. Uh, I started my first set of comments saying the eloquence of the speakers that are going to speak on this issue, I think, is overpowering. Um, their depth, their knowledge, and their passion with this subject, I think, goes very deep. And I'll just be brief. You are at a defining juncture of your elected office this evening on voting on this and bringing it at least according to the public comment that you've sat here and listened to. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Byron, uh, you didn't speak at first I did. reading. Does that disqualify me? It does. Oh, no. Well, good evening. Um, other second time speakers? No other second time speakers? We'll close the public hearing. There's no other second time speakers? Is nobody's, you just have to stand up. Move to the. Pedro Huda, 280 South Street. So, like Ms. Bagley said, I was looking forward to some kind of presentation tonight. But instead, I went to the website and updated myself. What I found there, and I do have pictures of the original and the new one, the original picture had green space in it. Looking at the new one that we've gotten, it is exactly what counselor, former Councillor uh, Paige Trace said. It goes to the end of the property. It really implies that the green space is gone. And the buildings have been taken up another story. There's no space that's labeled post office, which was one of the bigger requests of the, of the residency. And I'm, I'm struggling to see, I printed the lower level that has the parking for the, I counted about 57, 51 residential um, places in here because all of the old spots that were in the original plan that were supposed to be condos that we weren't supposed to have are now apartments. Apartments need parking. The spaces in the, in the basement for this are 51 spaces. So where are these people gonna park? Where are the people that, are, that have all the retail space going to park? I urge you to look at all of these plans. The next thing I want to ask is, in reading the motion here, to defray the expenditures for design and engineering for alternative plans. So basically, this council is asking the citizenry to come up with another $150,000 for unknown expenditures to unknown contractors for unknown services. Now, I guess I would ask, how many of you would write a check or agree to pay something for this kind of description if somebody came to your house and wanted to build something? But you're asking the residents to do that. I also have here the original request for proposal that was put out. 
I don't know how many of you have read it. I have. And in here, the preferred uses provide significant opportunity for the public to gather and enjoy the property. This plan, if this is the plan moving forward, I guess I would say I could see why you didn't want to bring it into the public for seven months and see transparency, because it does not fulfill anything that was in your original RFP. And if you're going to take this to the National Park Service again, it's going to be really hard for you to say that there's significant public benefit, because there's not. Next thing I would like to touch on is your, your having an issue with the financial plan and the ground lease. Is this Groundhog Day? How many times does this have to happen to this council? We gave you an out. We gave you an opportunity to find something else, and you went back to this. The contract that you signed, contrary to probably what Ms. Morrell was informed of, does not have any outs. We gave you $2 million as residents to get rid of the lawsuit and the threat of any lawsuit. And the first thing that comes back to us is we're still under threat of litigation. There's some problems here. And as far as this resident is concerned, who has inside knowledge of all of this, because I go in and pull all the stuff, this is a bad decision that's only getting worse. And from my perspective, I'd like to know what we are giving you $150,000 for when these plans are changed from what the original, uh, what the original plans were that I know Councillor Kelly said, we're gonna, that's what we want. We want the community plan. That doesn't look like what you're getting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Huda. Uh, Gerald Duffy, 428 Pleasant Street. Um, thanks for uh, letting me speak this evening. Um, I, uh, I too had some questions about the, the, the decision or the motion to appropriate another $150,000 for this project. And there's a letter in your packet, in fact, an email from me saying that we really need, um, we need more information before we commit more, more funds. Um, I've kind of changed my mind on that based on what I've been hearing tonight. Um, the, clearly what we need, as other speakers have pointed out, is a pro forma financial statement um, before the city moves ahead either with Redgate Kane or with some other alternative. Um, so I would support the motion tonight to appropriate that money because I think I trust you that you need this money to get to that point. So it's two months out from now, approximately. Um, and you, um, I believe that you will put that money to good use so that when that two-month point comes, we've got a decision to make about the project. Um, the, uh, the thing that I kind of most uh, wanted to make, so, so you, you know, you've got a hard decision, you're at the fork in the road. Um, the thing that, that kind of concerns me is, uh, is not, um, you, you know, you're, you're kind of in the moment and occupied with that, but for the public discussion, uh, which will continue, um, it's very important that we uh, respect the history of the project and the accuracy of, of that history. Um, I don't think anyone is intentionally trying to mislead others. Um, but there have been notes in the paper, and, and here we, we heard it again tonight here, um, misleading information. For instance, to say that the National Park Service rejected that first application uh, is untrue. They never rejected anything. Um, there's a draft, um, a draft response from the city that never got sent because it was too late in the, in the uh, last council um, that has uh, all the, it has a laundry list from the National Park Service. Most of the points were minor. They were small language changes that could be revised. 
Um, there were a couple of substantive issues. One was the height of a particular building, and it turns out that that had already been addressed because the, um, the NPS had been looking at earlier drawings. Um, the other issue was with, um, with the profit margin of the developer. And once again, the city had prepared an answer for that. There was, there was nothing, uh, no, nobody thought at that point that there was anything like a, um, a showstopper. Um, so it's important to get these things right. So when we use the, the terminology we rejected, or the National Park Service rejected that agreement, it's simply not true. And what I would ask my fellow citizens is that they do more homework, um, that it's not just you all who have a responsibility, but we have a responsibility as citizens to get our information right and to ask good questions in good faith and um, to treat the council with respect. Um, so I would ask people to uh, check, their, uh, check their sources. Um, there was one other example recently in a paper where someone who I think is here tonight said that the city uh, hired the UNH Survey Center to conduct uh, the survey that we did, the postcard survey, which is also untrue. Um, the subcommittee designed the, the questionnaire and it was so problematic that the city, it was beyond the scope of the city to make sense of the data. So at that point, they had to reach out to the UNH uh, Survey Center after the fact. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, one of the main points that, that Tracy Kearns from the center said when she gave a presentation to the subcommittee was that the, uh, the city would be strongly advised not to make any or to, to exercise great caution if they made any decisions based on that data. And that especially applied to the, fi the financial question where a lot of people appeared to be willing to spend, uh, for the city to spend money on the project, but it was always, it depends what for and in what form. And those were uh, written in largely in comments on the uh, survey postcards, and they were never addressed. So had they been addressed at that point, we would be in a very different place now, probably. So um, I encourage the, uh, the council to make your tough decision. Uh, I would also say that, you know, spend the 150,000, it's small change compared with all the money we've already poured into that project, um, and make a good decision for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Any other second time speakers? Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. Um, if Mr. Duffy is accurate, then I would ask city management and the council to clarify. Because it seems like there's differences of opinions. And I know I sat there during this process, a portion of this process. So I believe he makes a great point. The citizens don't know. The citizens don't know what's going on. The citizens don't know what you're thinking. We don't have a pro forma. And we do not know what the federal government's looking for. So again, where's the doorstop? Let us know. It seems like people are confused in accordance to the previous speaker. It seems like we don't know what we're talking about in accordance to the previous speaker. But I know I sat up there for a lot of it. I truly believe I knew what I was talking about for the most part, unless things have changed. So I ask, what has changed? I ask, where's the information? I ask, where's the budget? Those seem to be simple things that we can ask for. And I don't think we're <coughs> gonna change or be in legal issues. Those should be general information, especially if that information is gonna to go to the federal government, it should definitely be out there. So if we're as confused as Mr. Duffy just shared, then please set us straight and give us the detail. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Any other second time speakers? 
Any other second time speakers? There's one on Zoom there. All right, Zalita. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi, good evening. Thanks for um, allowing us to speak tonight. Um, I think I agree with uh, most of the residents who have spoken to you uh, and to this council tonight asking to not approve uh, this, this new money um, handout. Uh, this has been a bad relationship. We do not want to continue in this abusive relationship. What is happening here is that the city has refused since former uh, city manager John Bohenko to really put in place a governance for public-private partnerships. Uh, we had materials and examples and guidances from the European Union, uh, you name it, on alerting about how to protect the public benefit how the importance of making a structure and a governance that not only protected but gave visibility as to the status and protection of that public benefit throughout the entire life cycle of the project. That has never been done. You have already spent $2 million. And I am sorry if the former speaker thinks that another 150 is a change, a change for whom? Let me tell you, a lot of people in Portsmouth okay would think that that 150 would come very handy right now you are allowing yourself by a, giving another handout from our money to someone who very easily is enjoying this because it's free money he's not doing anything he's not delivering anything he found a way by threatening 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 we can get a, around that by threatening the city and just milk as much as we can. Cut the ties. It's past time to let go. Just let go. This is our property, and we really don't need the abuse. Now, you can vote to approve this at your own. Let your conscience speak. But I think a lot of speakers have provided you with sound information, sound knowledge. So let let's act not by fear and let's just cut this this is abusive stop this right now you have no reason whatsoever they're going to threaten another lawsuit all the time they have been threatening all along and they'll continue to threat so what so let's cut this i would appreciate you not cave in and just stop this on the track right now thank you thank you zalita any other Zoom speakers? Any other uh, final speakers? Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Mayor McEachran. Councillor Tabor, I spent two years working with you on the subcommittee with Chairman Whalen, in full disclosure to everyone. I am here tonight to say that none of us would be willing to put up with a 75-year bad marriage. None of us. And so, I'm asking all of you, how would you feel about that? Hold your nose and vote yes to 75 years of someone being critical and suing you every time you turned around. <coughs> you leave a legacy. You leave it to the next council. So although people like Mr. Duffy have certainly stated very eloquently that we need to go away silently into the sunset and let you solve this. I ask you, how would you feel about a 75 year bad marriage? Thank you. Thank you, Paige. 
I am lucky that I don't have to comp contemplate that. I have a wonderful wife, Lori. <laughs> I'm grateful for every day. I don't see, uh, was Chris Brown a speaker before? No. no. I'm sorry, Chris, you had to have spoken earlier. Um, are there any other final speakers? All right. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone rise. Going once, going twice. Closing the public hearing on this. Now, additional uh, council questions and deliberations. Um, I'm going to go and, and say a few things uh, before asking for some, uh, if there's other questions. Um, I understand this is a, uh, a difficult, would be an understatement, uh, process. Uh, it's consumed an enormous amount of our collective time as a city. And forget the money. Um, if we had spent as much time and effort on any number of the challenges that we face uh, in the city, I, I can't help but think we would be in a better position uh, as a city uh, today. That being said, we're presented with uh, an option uh, in front of us, um, an option that's a result of a settlement agreement. Now, the settlement agreement was to settle the case previously brought before uh, the city council by our development partner. I continue to stand by uh, the ability to settle that case for $2 million uh, to have the ability to work towards the community plan. There was not another possibility for that. Uh, and for all of the depositions of the previous council, myself included, that we avoided in uh, settling that case, uh, s giving us an opportunity to pursue this, it was worth it uh, to me. Now, I understand in this room that seems like a minority report, and I respect that. Um, but I stand by the fact that we settled the case in order to move on with a settlement agreement that is also a binding legal contract that we have to work uh, as hard as we can in order to support a National Park Service application. And in order to do that, we have to agree on things that everyone here tonight mentioned, things like a pro forma. We have to agree on a pro forma. We would then have to agree, once we get that information, on a ground lease. We do not have a ground lease. We, we, we have to negotiate that along with the development agreement before we can come back and put an application in to the National Park Service. We are not at that point right now. Um, and a decision that, that we made collectively as a council, and I very much champion was to make sure that our city manager and our legal team could negotiate in order to bring us something that we could vote up or down, that we could have a discussion about. We have not received that yet. We have a community plan, came in pretty expensive. We have to negotiate in order to find a way to be able to support an application to the National Park Service. We need more money in order to do that to negotiate that in order to submit an application or try to submit an application. It's not a guarantee that if we spend $150,000 over the next three months that we are going to get an application. We are going to do our best effort to do so, not just because that's spelled out in the settlement agreement, but because we have a responsibility to take advantage of submitting an application to the National Park Service. I truly hope that we can do that, but it's not a guarantee that we will be able to do that. But this gets us a little bit closer to saying we tried everything that we could in order to make this a reality. I hope that we can do that, and I hope this money is, is money well spent in that effort. I understand that it's frustrating not to hear more about that. I am frustrated that we are in a position where we don't have an application that we're discussing in public uh, in front of you, but we are not at that point yet, 
and we need additional money in order to get to that point or hope to be able to get to that point. So with that, Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I have some lengthy comments, so would you want me to go first or last? <laughs> go for it. All right. Um, so appreciate everybody coming here to talk tonight and to express their opinions. I'm going to give a little uh, history of the McIntyre project from my perspective as a citizen and then where we are tonight. Um, I don't if, know if, I mean, Councilor Bagley, I got I'm about not five sure minutes of comments. If this, this audience needs the history of the McIntyre. <laughs> uh, well, I, I might have a nugget that they don't know. Um, almost 20 years ago, on February 7th, 2003, uh, the headline of the Portsmouth Herald was City Eyesore Tagged for Demolition. And it's a picture of our favorite building. So, so the saga of this $1 building that Senator Judd Gregg was going to give to the city of Portsmouth has been going on for almost two decades now. And uh, I guess SAG is probably the right term uh, used to discuss it. And, you know, before I ran for council, when people asked me about the McIntyre, I, I thought, you know, that, that's crazy. It's the ugliest building in town. Why are we turning it into a monument? Still think that. However, um, that's a personal opinion. That's ridiculous. Not my opinion as a city councilor. Um, so where are we today? Well, the reason we are where we are today is because um, in 2020, in late January of 2020, uh, the new council had uh, taken their seats for less than a month, uh, with the exception of former Mayor Rick Beckstead, who had been on the previous council. And there was a motion. And the uh, Councilor Tabor moved to reconsider, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, Mayor Beckstead closed the public comment. Assistant Mayor Splain said we need to enter a non-public session and hear from the city attorney on this matter. He said the city council would come back to the chambers at the close of the non-public session. Councilor Lazenby echoed the remarks of his Assistant Mayor Splain to take careful considerations on this matter. He said we'll need time and are spending time working on this matter. On a roll call vote, four to five, motion to enter into a non-public session to discuss the drown draft ground lease failed to pass. Assistant Mayor Splain, Councilor McCatron, Lazenby, and Tabor voted in favor. Councilors Whalen, Kennedy, Huda, Trace, and Mayor Bruce <coughs> voted opposed. Councilor McCatron said we have spent a great deal of time dealing with this matter, but not talking about it is wrong. He said he's not heard any information since the non-public session and has strong objections to put the city in jeopardy. He said we need to negotiate in good faith. He stated we have a responsibility to the public and he appreciates that we want to act on this matter, but we have not addressed the answers to go back to the National Park Service that address the issue of mass of the building and the financials. Councilor McCashin said this motion is hasty and we have not finished the conversation from the, non, from the last non-public <coughs> session. Councilor Tabor said he voted yes to hear from the city attorney on his legal opinion. Councilor Whalen said we opened the dialogue between us as a city council. He said he was elected in November and the first communications from Red Rick Kane was a threat of litigation. He said we are sending the proper message to Reggie Kane that we want to look at the project. He indicated that he would make another motion on receiving feedback regarding where we stand in the National Park Service. Council Lazenby said the form of the ground leaf drafted is dated December 7th, 2019, that we received an email in January, is that the document on the website is unavailable. He said he is concerned that we are trying to move forward with public input and a form of the government ground lease has not been available for the public to review. It does not feel clear to him or transparent. Councilor Kennedy said she was voted on the city council regarding the McIntyre project. She tried to get the developer to get to the design changed. She said the ground lease has not been voted on and it is time to make a decision and move on. She stated we needed to make sure GSA does not give up on us. She stated it is time to listen to Councilor Trace's motion and called for a vote. Assistant Mayor Splain had said 25 months ago on December 20th, 2017, the vote was eight to one to set up the process and led to the selection of Redgate Kane for the project. He said he has been involved in this matter since day one. Assistant Mayor Splain said not getting the advice from the city attorney whether we agree on it or not. We need to listen to city attorney Sullivan. He stated we need to hire someone that can give expert advice. We need to revisit the McIntyre project and not get us into a lawsuit. He said he is concerned we are not moving into non-public session. City Manager Kennard says she agrees with Assistant Mayor Splain and urges the council that we go into non-public session because we have new information to rely on, relay to the city council. Councilor Tabor moved to reconsider and enter into non-public se session. 
seconded by Councillor McEttrin. On roll call vote of four to five, motion failed to pass. A two thirds vote was required. Assistant Mayor Splain, Councillor McEttrin, Lazenby, and Tabor voted in favor. Councillors Whalen, Kennedy, Huda, Trace, and Mayor Beckstead voted opposed. That's why we are here today, because councillors with three weeks of service, and as far as I know, no legal background, decided to take in action on a contract without hearing legal advice from the city attorney. That, that is just disrespectful to the citizens of this city. You can listen to legal advice as an elected official and not agree with it and make a different decision. That is your right as a voted or as an elected official to, to overrule the advice that legal will give you and say, no, I know better and this is why. But to not even listen to the legal advice is why we are here tonight and why we have a boondoggle on our hands. So what I am going to do tonight, even though I was the only one to vote against the settlement agreement, because I didn't think it made sense at the time, and, and I still wish the vote had gone the other way, tonight I will vote in favor of the $150,000 appropriation, which I think is a significant amount of money that I would much rather spend on lights for a skateboard park. However, we are in a pickle, and we are in a pickle because people chose not to even listen to legal advice. So I'm pretty upset tonight because a majority of this council term has been spent dealing with cleaning up the mess of people that did not respect the citizens of this city enough to even consider legal advice before making a decision that they knew could possibly cost the city tens of millions of dollars. So yes, we are in a difficult place. Yes, we cannot tell you everything we'd like to tell you. However, the design is on the website. The settlement agreement is on the website. The property still belongs to the US government. And we need this money so that we can put the financial report together so that we can present it to the city. So I will be voting in favor of the motion tonight. And I'm ashamed of the actions of the people on the previous council who would not even listen to legal advice. Councillor Tabor. False. That's not nice. All false, false, Andrew. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, uh, first off, I, I was a part of that difficult process, that difficult vote that we, we wanted to hear a legal opinion and didn't. So thank you, Councillor Bagley, for, for bringing that piece of history up. Um, there's no easy answer here, um, but I think our goal is to uh, get a full submission to the Park Service. I'm deeply invested in the people's plan, having been part of the subcommittee and an advocate for study circles uh, that brought people together, that mined what the public wanted in that site they wanted an active gathering place. They wanted green space. They wanted an observation gallery. They wanted it a place that we as residents could go and enjoy. And, and somehow we need to balance that with a developer with whom we've had a contract for a long time. I think um, to get a full submission to the NPS, First off, I think the design as has been stated is on the website and it is true to the community plan with some minor changes. Um, I believe that having looked at it, having voted for it. Um, the costs of the community plan have come in on the high side and the missing ingredient here is the financial pro forma. So my vote tonight is the 150,000 will help us develop the pro forma and our contract says we can modify the plan to make it more economically realistic if we need to with the development partner and we need design options to do that. I will continue to advocate for everything the people wanted in the community plan. I was part of that process, um, but we're going to need a little more expertise 
to see if we can make it work. Um, we've come this far, and I don't think it's time to sew, sew our pocket shut. Um, certainly not in, in light of the terms of a contract we have. We're in a public-private partnership. The city has obligations. The developer has obligations. We have to see if we can make the project work within that framework. And we have a deadline with the Park Service and the GSA. Uh, so we, we have to, I think, spend this money to get to the pro forma to see if we can get the right balance of costs and that we're not going to burden, unduly burden the taxpayer. Um, and I would ask the city manager, will we be able to fully understand the costs of the project more so than we do now if we spend this money? Mr. Mayor, thanks. Yes, the whole idea of the exercise and the work to be done is to <coughs> ground truth the numbers that have come out in the pro forma and the cost estimating received and to better understand what we could put forth uh, as the city's conversation continues with the developer relative to pro forma uh, contribution agreement, ground lease development agreement. And to do that, we need to do this work. We would then bring the work to the council and share the findings with the public. Councilor Murrow. Um, I'm hoping that the city manager, since some people in the room have stated that they didn't know that the design plans were made available to the public, maybe she could just let it let everyone know where they can find those plans on our website. Right. It's my understanding they're on the McIntyre page. So if you if you set, type in the search bar McIntyre, and I'm looking for our public information officer to verify this. It's my understanding they're all there. Councilor Denton? No? Okay. Uh, Councilor Bagley? Uh, thank you very Sorry, I got a little heated there, but, you know, when we make mistakes as a council, and, and I mean any council, this council, any other council, it puts an undue burden on the people that live here because they have to pay for those mistakes. If I, if I make a mistake and do something that costs the city money, it doesn't come out of my, um, unfortunately, not $50,000 a year paycheck. I think it's about $48,000 less than that. Um, it comes out of the taxpayers fund. So I, I did get a little heated. Um, so I, I forgot the key point after all that. So that meeting happened in uh, late January 2020. And if the council had listened to legal advice and there had been some delay, it is possible that um, what happened in March of 2020 may have uh, had mitigation, mitigating factors. So I guess what I'm trying to say is being hasty almost never leads to a better outcome. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Councilor Bagley, and for commenting on getting heated. Um, it's not, you know, we're, there's only one council. Um, there's not a next council and previous council, it's this council. Um, I hope that we can make the best decisions uh, for Portsmouth. Um, and I've committed um, to always try to put Portsmouth in the best possible position in order to get the most out of this parcel of land uh, as possible. It's my continued commitment that I'm not going to support a project that doesn't have a direct identifiable public benefit. I think we need this money in order to truly test every assumption out there uh, and uncover uh, every opportunity to put a winning application forward. If we do that and, and we fall short either through the MPS or we can't come to terms with our development partner on all of those different documents that we have to agree on, then I feel as though I've done as best I can on this. But we need this money in order to do that. Um, and so I will be supporting this because I believe it is the next best option for the city of Portsmouth. I appreciate that many of you disagree with that, um, but I am bound by what I believe is in our best interests as a city, and so I'll be supporting this. 
with that, seeing no other comment, I will ask for a roll call vote. I don't believe there's a motion on that. Oh, we'll I'll make the right. motion. Make it. <laughs> yeah. okay. I guess uh, I would wait a motion uh, to adopt the resolution as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Thanks, Kel, and all that. Yeah. We didn't even, we talked all that time. We didn't even have a motion on the floor. That's all right. Ugh. You want to talk some it more? It happens. <laughs> Assistant Mayor Kelly. Aye. Councillor Tabor. Yes. Councillor Denton. Yes. Councillor Moreau. Yes. Councillor Bagley. Yes. Councillor Lombardi. Yes. Councillor Blaylock. Yes. Councillor Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachran. Yes. Unanimous. Going to take a 10 minute recess.
All right. We're good. <laughs> I don't know. The new year, forget everything, how it all works. All right. Welcome back. Um, we're going to go back into it. Um, first up, the first reading of ordinance. And I'll just, uh, the first reading of ordinance uh, amending Chapter 7. Uh, Article 4A, Section 7A.408, Taxi Stands Designated. It weighed a sample motion to pass first reading and schedule a second reading and a public hearing at the January 23rd, 2023 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? No, nope, just thanks, Assistant Mayor. Good call out on. Just trying on to get this. us some more parking spaces. And uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to that day. So. Um, we do have to have a roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. <coughs> yes. Okay. Councilor Denton. Yes. Councilor Moreau. Yes. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Councilor Lombardi. Yes. Councilor Blaylock. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Mayor McKechnie. Yes. Unanimous. Next up, uh, public hearings of ordinance and adoption of resolution, public hearing, second reading of ordinance, amending chapter one, article four, section 1.408, cable television and communications commissions to be named cable and broadband internet commission. Uh, tonight, we have a presentation. Mr. Mayor, we had the benefit of two of the cable commission members, Rob Capone and Jason Hewitt. Uh, due to the lateness of the hour, they did leave. Uh, however, Deputy City Manager, Deputy City Attorney Suzanne Woodland is here in their stead to make a brief presentation. Sorry, guys. This probably could have happened before the McIntyre. <laughs> Appreciate you guys sticking it out for a little bit. Um, so, and uh, having uh, spoken with both commissioners uh, just of, you know, 25 minutes ago or so when they left, um, if you would prefer to hear from them, you could, they would not be in any way offended if you simply wanted to reschedule the public hearing for the next meeting, or alternatively, I'd be happy to uh, summarize here right now uh, the Cable Commission's desire to really officially expand uh, the scope of their mission, which is to look beyond simply the uh, franchise agreement that we typically have with um, Comcast, our cable television provider, and try to address some of the other what they call transport issues in terms of the provision of internet uh, here in the city of Portsmouth. So looking at in particular cellular service, um, they did send their draft changes to the governance committee just to see if uh, there were any other uh, thoughts uh, that could be gleaned from either the public or the committee members. It was generally uh, some concurrence that this change makes some sense. Uh, there's already been one meeting set up by the city of Portsmouth with representatives of Verizon and members of the Cable Commission, and we hope to set up others to start to stimulate a level of interest in kind of resolving what we, I think, most of us have experienced with, for example, our cell phone coverage in various portions of the city. So that's their uh, mission, if you will, to, to try and expand formally uh, their role so that they can be a voice uh, to advocate for some improvements. So really is up to you. If you'd like to hear from them, they're happy to come back and try again. Or if you want to just move it forward, they're good with that too. Okay. Council Brody. Um, yeah, <clears throat> having reviewed that, that, that ordinance and um, having had discussions um, with that, those representatives on the um, governance committee um i th i think that the changes are pretty simple and straightforward and um, <coughs> i think they um they represent the intent of what they want so i would suggest that we move on and um, pick it up and move to a third reading all right would you make that a motion Yes. Second. No. It is public hearing. Public hearing. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That's right. We do need the public hearing. Um, <laughs> but the motion is now on the table. Uh, open this up to a. Can I just question? 
One question first. I just, we need to make sure that when we do finalize this, the section A, the very first line, has the old name instead of the new name in it, in the ordinance. Oh. So I just wanna make sure that gets updated, that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, uh, I will open the public hearing on the uh, ordinance to uh, change uh, the uh, chapter one Article 4, Section 1.408. All interested participants, seeing none, I'm going to uh, close or, yeah, I'll close the public hearing on this. Any other questions? No, uh, just one comment before we vote. This is, uh, you know, it's these. If you're trying to make government a little better um, and you realize most of the time uh, your people's lives uh, just are such a, a, a big part of it and they look sometimes to government to solve things. The amount of time people have reached out to us about cell phone service in the city of Portsmouth, it's unbelievable how powerful they think we are uh, here that we can actually change, you know, what uh, Verizon does or AT&T does. Uh, and before, we had no ability to do so. It's not to say that we will make, you know, this a cell phone utopia for, for everyone, uh, but we'll have a seat at the table because of these changes. I commend uh, the, the Cable Television and Communications Commission uh, to, to make these changes, to look proactively at how we can improve people's lives. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the effort that went into these changes and I will be supporting them. So with that, a roll call vote. <clears throat> Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. Yes. Councilor Moreau. Yes. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Councilor Lombardi. Yes. Councilor <coughs> Goldblatt. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern. Yes. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. And we're now on to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. First up would be a request to, believe it or not, amend the public art funds ordinance, which we just completed. Um, and the sample motion is in your packet. Um, long story short, what we've realized with the very first project uh, that's looking to uh, take advantage of some excess funds that remain in the public art trust is that when the legislation or the ordinance was initially contemplated, it did not contemplate a surplus of funds uh, to be left over. And I'll, I'll draw your attention to the requirement that at least 90% of the funds set aside for public art be expended for the project. So in the case of the Foundry Art Project, approximately 84% or I'm, I'm sorry, 86% was expended leaving 4% or $6,100. So we found all this out in looking to honor the request of the council and the, and the vote taken at the last meeting to support the sculpture garden as part of the 400th project. So in order to remedy this situation in the event where less than 90% of the funds set aside for a public art project can be spent, it can uh, be amended with a simple phrase and a simple amendment to the existing ordinance that is mentioned in red. So with the indulgence of the council, we would like to uh, place this on the council agenda for the next meeting on January 23rd for first <coughs> reading to make this amendment. Mm -hmm. And so it will await that motion to place the funding of public art ordinance chapter one, article 17, section 1.1705 on the city councilor's January 23rd, 2023 agenda for first reading. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I just have a question as to whether or not then we have to redo the vote on the expenditure of the funds. Uh, I think it would be cleanest if we did. Okay. Thank you. For the trustees, yeah. Right, I think that the trustees would, it would make the. So can we do that at second reading or do we have to wait till third reading? We can combine second and third reading. Mm -hmm. And, and then do it do this, that. Right. And then we have to do it the next meeting or can we do it at that meeting? We'll, we'll come back to you with that information okay. at second reading. Thanks. <coughs> Any other discussion? 
Councilor Cook. Um, I just wanted to say that this dovetails very nicely with the changes that were already made, especially around capital projects where they're in a location that we would unlike, we'd be unlikely to place a piece of public art. It allows the council to move that. Say we have a project at, at our reservoir and we want to pace, place a piece of public art related to that project, this would also allow us to, to move that into the city. Great. Uh, roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Unanimous. The second item under city manager's action items this evening is a request for a third <coughs> construction license for the project at 64 Bond Street. And to summarize, if I may, there were, this will be the third license uh, request. The first one included uh, the use of 35 square feet on Bon Mall along with 14 parking spaces in the Worth lot. And that was, that was for a period from March 5th, 2022 through June 3rd, 2022. Mm -hmm. The council then granted a second license to use 650 square feet of the alley that abuts the property and connects Hanover Street to the Worth lot for the purpose of setting a crane along with 10 spaces all in the worth lot from September 20th, 2022 through January 1st of this year, 2023. Due to delays uh, in the project's design, the applicant is requesting a third license to encumber a total of 10 parking spaces in the worth lot, specifically uh, four along the alley and six in the lot. And I think it would be important to note that the four spaces in the alley would be for the purpose of erecting a safety fence, not for parking. And you have the benefit of the applicant's map in your packet, which uh, shows the green line running roughly, um, not quite half through half of the parking spaces, but they would not be used for parking, it would be used for a fence. Um, I'd also like to clarify that uh, the commenter in public comments suggested the we'd been giving away parking spaces at, at, at no time where this the parking space is given away they were paid for by the applicant and um, so the request today would take the project from january 10th which is tomorrow through to april 1st and uh, the total license fee for this work would be twenty eight thousand seven hundred dollars and the representative for the applicant shane forsley is here tonight if the council has any questions thank you shane and thank you city manager any questions assistant mayor thank you um, Mr. Forster, we heard, uh, and we can see some, some of these photos, that we, it does seem like these spots um, have currently been used, and they, it does seem that they do block the easement for people to get in and out of, their, of that garage. So I would, I would wonder if you um, and the construction team would have a solution for that, for turn radius, and to potentially leave that spot more open. Certainly, to alleviate that pressure, um, just to clarify, in the future plans for this area in the alley, there's going to be four parking spaces. Um, those four spaces belong to uh, employees and or owners um, who work in the Worth Condominium Association. It's all those buildings essentially across the lot. Um, and we've been facilitating uh, uh, moving their parking um, throughout the project with the cooperation and participation of the parking department. and. Uh, to reiterate that um, there will be no parking in those four spaces. It's essentially a safety buffer um, to keep our work site contained. Um, I know in those pictures you do see people parking there, um, but obviously that's a uh, it's an issue getting in and out of that parking garage. So that's what we're we're trying to alleviate. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Councillor Tabor has his hand up. Councillor Tabor. Yes. Uh, question for the city manager: How will we? Uh, make sure that uh, as the applicant says there's no parking there how will we hold them accountable uh, going forward well well we would make sure they were adhering to the the language in the license agreement and our zoning enforcement officer jason page is no stranger to uh, that part of the world and to projects that are taking place uh, in in current time so jason will be sure to enforce that Sure, Jason's usual enthusiasm will apply. 
<laughs> if Jason has any problems, he's no stranger. He'll, he knows where to find me. So. He's not. Uh, Councilor Denton. Thank you. This may be a silly question, but there's not going to be vehicles now parking behind the safety fence, are there? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Nobody will be parking in that alleyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilor Cook. Um, thank you for coming tonight and answering our questions. Um, do you envision this as kind of the last request for an extension, or do you think you'll need a future encumbrance? <laughs> well, the last time I was here, I told you it would be my last last request for a license, and uh, I'm back here again today. Um, I'm confident in our ability to complete the work that we need to get done in uh, the stated period of time. Now, I've worked uh, cooperatively with the building department, the legal department. They've helped us with encumbrances versus licenses, and uh, we're confident that we're going to be able to accomplish the project without having to come back to you guys to ask you for something like this again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Barty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, since people are used to parking in those, those areas, will you be putting no parking signs <coughs> on there, the fence? Yes, I'm sure we'd work out some sort of mechanism with the parking department, um, whether it's us who puts the sign up or them. Mm -hmm. We can make sure that that's the case. I know if you, uh, at least while we still had those uh, spaces originally under license, it was almost like free-for-all parking where on a weekend if we went away, even though our, our fence was up. It didn't necessarily stop the guy who may own a restaurant down the road or somebody parking there on, but that's uh, something that the parking department can, can facilitate as long as we do hold up our end of the bargain. If I may, Your Honor, uh, in addition to Jason enforcing the parking enforcement officers, will keep, keep an eye on this situation as well and adhere mm -hmm. to the no parking signs. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Thank you, Shane. It seems like we can uh, we can likely approve this. Um, do we need to change it to require signage on this? Is this or is this something that we will uh, take up administratively? Administratively, we can work with um, building and parking departments to ensure that the proper signage is in place <laughs> along the fence. Right. Well, um, you know, I, the uh, we're all uh, eagerly anticipating when. Uh, <coughs> you know, Novacure is able to move in. We're all uh, fans of the mission of Novacure, um, but we have to look at all of these, uh, you know, even if it's companies looking to cure uh, or prolong the, the life of terminal cancer, we still have to look at it in terms of does this, uh, does this meet the need um, and align with uh, the goals. I, I believe that we can go to the Provident uh, Condominium HOA and say that, that when asked, uh, you know, this team committed to making sure that their access and egress uh, to that um, was, uh, uh, will be maintained um, and approved upon. And, you know, it's not lost on, you know, when we're talking about uh, timelines, I, I do remember there's a giant crack that developed on the side of the building. so. You know, I'm sure that that uh, wasn't the easiest thing to rectify. You know, appreciate the ingenuity to do that and yeah. also keep everybody in Portsmouth safe mm -hmm. while you do that. So wish you uh, a speedy completion to this project and look forward to welcoming in the new tenants to the downtown. That will be a great day. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. We uh, need a motion. We need to yeah. <coughs> wait a motion to... And make a motion that we move that the city manager be authorized to execute and accept the temporary construction license to encumber the use of 10 parking spaces in the worth lot for a term of 82 days. As <coughs> Second. Can we please have a roll call vote? Yes. <coughs> Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. Yes. Councilor Moreau. Yes. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Councilor Lombardi. <coughs> yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Thanks, Shane. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Last under items requiring action are requests for two easements related to the St. Patrick School located at 315 Banfield Road. The first easement is for the city to grant to the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation, also uh, known as St. Patrick School, a sewer easement for existing sewer infrastructure across the city's the community campus parcel that the city now owns. And uh, the second easement is to is for 
accepting an easement from the school to provide access to water infrastructure <coughs> that they installed privately so that the city can have convenient access for inspection and leak detection purposes. And really this is um, finalizing easements. The foundation um, had not conveyed prior to the transfer of the property to the city. And by the property, I mean the community campus. Although all parties, including the city, were aware of the easements needed. So drafts of the sewer easement deed and plan to be recorded are included. There is a possibility of minor adjustments or edits that may need to be made. However, the water easement is more straightforward and um, the school mistakenly recorded the access easement for water service prior to the council <coughs> approval. So we're looking to gain that council approval tonight. So the idea would be to uh, grant the city manager the authority to both finalize and execute a sewer easement from the city to the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation and to accept on behalf of the city the access easement for water service as presented and Deputy City Manager Suzanne Woodland can he answer any questions on the legal front. Any questions? Mm. Right. Oh, Councillor Cook. Um, I just have one question on the sewer <coughs> easement on the community campus side. I'm sorry to bring you all the way up here. Thank you. Um, uh, it's not terribly clear to me from looking at the map exactly where this is um, <coughs> on the campus property. Is is there is this going to present any challenges in the future for development? From what I can tell, it looks like it's in wetlands, but um, I'm I'm wanting to kind of get a better feel for exactly where this is on the property. But we are not anticipating that it is going to cause a problem, and uh, my recollection is. We put some language in there to um, <coughs> require relocation should it become inconvenient. So, thank you. I'd wait a motion uh, then to uh, move to grant the city manager authority to both finalize and execute a sewer easement from the city to the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation to accept on behalf of the city the access easement for water services as presented. So moved. Second. Any further discussion on this? Kelly, when you're ready, roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? <coughs> yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Unanimous. All right. Thank you, city manager. <clears throat> Next up, our consent agenda. I'd wait a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Oh, no. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Yeah. I look very much forward to the Ferry House tour coming back September 23rd. It was a huge success last year. I spent four hours there. Forward <laughs> <laughs> to spending another four. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we have email correspondence. Uh, I'd wait a motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. And we'll have a roll call vote when Kelly is ready. <coughs> Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Abstain. Abstain. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Yes. Motion passes eight, with eight to zero with one abstention. Your Honor, I know I'm not a counselor, but could I ask um, for suspension of the rules to allow the fire chief to speak to item 16D 
It's um, approval of a grant, acceptance of a grant, so that the oh, sure. management uh, performance grant can be spent on an updated plan. So moved. <coughs> Second. Second. Uh, and a roll call. Yep. Well, we just we just made a motion. Oh, to spend the ropes, right? Yeah. Making sure I got that. Okay, so <laughs> hold on, I just need to write that down. Yes. You're done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was it? I don't remember again. <coughs> I know. 16. 16. D. D. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. <coughs> Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McKechnie? Yes. Unanimous. All right. Um, we will. Is that a vote to suspend the rules or to yes, adopt the Yes, that grant? was to, to suspend, suspend the rules. Suspend the rules. Yes. And now we have. Section D, I'd wait a motion to approve and accept the grant as presented. So moved. Second. And this is the approval and acceptance of New Hampshire Department of Safety Division of Homeland and Emergency Management, Emergency Management Performance Grant, EMPG, in the amount of $5,500. And this would allow the Emergency Management Coordinator to update the plan, which was last updated five years ago. Wonderful. I don't have any questions when people offer us cash, so <laughs> I appreciate uh, I appreciate the work that went in in grabbing getting this grant. I'm sure you know people, cash doesn't fall off trees, so appreciate the effort that went into the, getting this grant, and look forward to the work that's going to be done on this. Is there any questions on this? None. Uh, Kelly, I will uh, when there's a roll call vote. Do we have a roll call vote on yes. the sample motion? Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thumbs up. He's already given thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't exactly. make you choose. <laughs> All right, um, next we have a letter from Perry Silverstein requesting the city not favor one industry over others regarding outdoor dining. I'd wait a motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. Uh, uh, thank you, I just, I just want to thank Perry. We did spend some time talking Sunday on short notice. All right, um, let us uh, have a roll call on this one if there's no other comment. Nope. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Danton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Unanimous. And next up, on to the council. Um, would like to, uh, Irish Mike informed me it was law enforcement day, so. Um, I'd like to call out our, our men and women in blue uh, for uh, the work they do every day. Um, but considering today is law enforcement day, thank you uh, for helping keep Portsmouth safe. Um, we have some appointments uh, to be voted uh, today. Um, first up, uh, a reappointment of Dana Levinson to the trustees of the trust funds, reappointment of Phyllis Eldridge to the ZBA, and the appointment of Alan Cohen to the task force to study Private Public Historical Archive Committees. I'd wait a motion to approve There's their. One more. There's one more. One more. Jeff, Jeff Keefe, Keefe. Jeff Keefe. to the same committee. Yep, oh. you're right. I'm. There's an updated agenda. It, yeah. oh. I neglected in the revised to put package. it on your portfolio. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> Listen, we can't forget about Jeff Keefe. <laughs> no, we can't. I am so sorry. Um, <laughs> to the private uh, public historical archives. Yes. So appointment of Alan Cohen and Jeff Keefe to the task force to study private public historical archives committee. So moved. Second. And we will have a roll call vote. <clears throat> Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Yes. Councilor B
Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor <coughs> McEachran? Yes. Unanimous. Before I uh, pass it on to Councilor Tabor, I would just remind everybody, get your flu shot. Uh, I got it two weeks ago, um, or I got the flu two weeks ago. <coughs> I still have a lingering cough. I'm not uh, contagious with that any longer, but don't mess around. You know, man flu is pretty tough out there, so get your flu shot on that. Um, Already done. Could save your life um, <laughs> or a, a long amount of complaining to your family. <laughs> All right, Councilor Tabor, you're up. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, and thanks to all of you for um, being patient with the roll call votes. I uh, hope this is the only meeting I'm not there in person and uh, my wife's getting much better and we should be able to travel this week, get back home. Um, I wanted to put a motion forward uh, uh, to sort of set the table for the January 25th budget kickoff. I would move for a report back on preliminary uh, FY24 trends, major budget drivers, potential tax impacts, and city manager guidelines at our January 25th, 2023 council budget kickoff work session. And if I have a second, I'll speak briefly to it. Second. Um, the, uh, for several years, our tax rate increases have been very low, less than two and a half percent. Um, but we benefited last year from a one-time $3.6 million of state funds on the revenue side. And uh, through COVID, we reduced staff and we had to bring them back to get the level of services up. Uh, so we have been adding staff, 27 positions last year uh, that have been <coughs> filled through the year. So that will recur in FY24's cost. So I'm asking the city manager uh, to give us a realistic look at the revenue changes and spending changes and how those and the other trends would impact the budget and the tax burden. So my uh, appeal to all of you as fellow counselors in approving this motion would be to say, let's see the trends up front and early in the budget process and not wait until we're midway through to see the direction things are going. And that way we can have a realistic discussion on the 25th and throughout the spring, uh, and we can all work together on whatever may be the challenging trends of this next budget. And I think it's also important because those preliminary city council discussions do set a tone. Um, and lastly, I wanted to revisit the idea of a spending guideline uh, that the city manager uses in discussions with police, school, and fire. Um, historically, that was something the city manager would provide, um, and we got away from it last year. Um, the benefit is that it treats all parts of the city equally, um, and so the city school board and police and fire don't come to us with increases that are out of step with city hall. Or worse, city hall has to, at the end, offset bigger increases elsewhere. So I think there's value in that and having a, uh, and so my motion predicates that we hear from the city manager on that topic. And I think it's the healthy discussion to have as a council. Thank you, Councilor Tabor. Any questions, Councilor Bagley? Uh, thank you, Your Honor, and, and thank you, Councilor Tabor for bringing this forward. I think it's a, a great idea. The only concern I have, and, and perhaps the city manager can answer this is, um, is there enough time with everything else on your plate for you to have this by just two weeks from today? Uh, if I may, Your Honor, the, this is, um, we can provide much of this information. It would be, um, it would be responsible for us to share as much, inf uh, much um, kind of <coughs> coming up to actions as we know to be true. And so we will share trends and, and drivers. It will be, um, We'll stop short of giving a preliminary budget, but we'll speak to what it what would be reasonable to us to expect on the horizon. So it, this is very much in keeping with what we'd like to plan to present. Great, thank you. 
Any other questions? Council Tabor, I have one just on the <coughs> guidelines. I understand you correctly that we would be discussing that um, our guidelines with the city manager and trying to set a, uh, I guess, a city council goal for the city manager guidelines for the departments. Is that how I should be reading that? Um, I think that I think we would have a discussion of would there be a, a guideline across all parts of the general fund uh, and would that be a direction that the city manager would want to go um, because we didn't do it in last year and and that was an exception um, I'm having discussed this with a little uh, discuss this with the manager and the finance director it's probably too early to start throwing numbers out um, we'll certainly see the major factors that shape the budget and the major um, pressures on us um, but I wanted to hear from her uh, as to whether a guideline would be helpful this year okay so in years previous at least while we've been on the council we've had things like a zero budget increase being a guideline and then having to back into that the ask is to hear what the pressures are on the budget um, and then to come up with guidelines based on that discussion is that fair that's right that's right okay and uh, you know and if we see um, <clears throat> big cost stream big impacts on the tax tax rate um, we want to deliver the same services, but are there, uh, is there a guideline that we can set that, that uh, works towards the best outcome for the taxpayer with given those factors? Okay. All right. Kelly, can we have a roll call vote? Yes, Mayor. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? <coughs> yes. <clears throat> Councilor Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. So, that was, I knew where you were going. I Mayor, <laughs> Mayor, point of order. We're going past 10.30. Uh, yep. Yeah. We need a roll call vote to go past 10.30. It's been loose. So moved? Second. Okay. Hmm? I forgot. I just I just looked at the time. So. <laughs> okay. Um, Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. Yes. Council Moreau. Yes. Council Bagley. Yes. Council Lombardi. <clears throat> yes. Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. <clears throat> Mayor McEachern. Yes. All right, Councilor Tabor, your second item is up. Yes, and uh, I'm happy to propose two motions. Well, I'll work in two parts on this uh, for the on behalf of the audit committee. Uh, sample motion one is move to adopt. I'm sorry. Um, unseal. Move to unseal that portion of the city council's non-public session meeting minutes dated December 14, 2022, relative to the selection of an auditor only. Second. Uh, second. And uh, the reason I wanted, we wanted to do this, uh, there's been a lot of interest in the auditing process uh, and also so that we can have deliberations and discussions tonight uh, more openly. Uh, I'm asking the council to unseal the minutes um, of the night the council heard the audit committee recommendations in non-public session. And the audit committee itself has also unsealed effective this evening, all of its minutes. So the entire process, if we vote to do so tonight, would be <coughs> transparent to the public. Any discussion? A roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. 
Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Mayor yes. And moving on, um, we're pleased to report the audit committee in its current form uh, did complete an RFP process and interviews and reference checks, and we have a unanimous recommendation to the council for action tonight on an auditor. Um, I would <coughs> move to select CLA for a three-year contract to perform audit services conditioned upon satisfactory contract negotiations. Second. Uh, as this auditor. All right, any discussion? Councillor Moreau. Um, <clears throat> we had a, a great meeting and in, uh, interviews with both of the um, two audit firms that did present uh, from our RFP. And I think that uh, moving forward, there's a lot less risk using CLA. One, it gives us a new auditing firm, but two, the other um, applicant was actually going to go through a merger process and it, it gave us a lot of concern that they would be really tied up in that process. So we wanted to give a new firm a chance and they made a really good presentation. So happy to move forward to use a new firm. Thank you, Councilor Moreau, Councilor Denton. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'll simply add to that that although I was opposed to the ordinance changes which landed me on the audit committee, <laughs> I am... Um, <laughs> That's um, why it landed you yeah, on the audit um, committee. I'm pleased to have participated <laughs> in the competitive process and I'm um, looking forward to um, this selection. Your Honor, if I could. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, we did benefit from the citizen members and their expertise uh, because what we did was rate the uh, competing bidders. Um, on their track record and experience, the quality and professionalism and training of their staff, their knowledge of New Hampshire law, the size and depth of their audit teams and their sampling and their analytic techniques and how they've done with deadlines. And we verified everything with references. Um, so uh, it was every individual's uh, conclude and then our collective conclusion that uh, this is going to be the right audit form for us. It may cost a little more, but I think the value is going to more than offset. Thank you, Councilor Tabor. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as a former member of the Audit Committee, I have to say that I am thrilled with the results of the work of the Audit Committee. I'm very appreciative of all the work that I, I know it takes to get to the, this end result. And um, I'm happy with the outcome of the changes we've made to the audit committee. Clearly, they've done a, a good job reviewing, and we've achieved a successful result in recommending an auditor tonight. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you again to Hawk, Jesse, and Chris, uh, citizen members uh, who worked uh, on this. Happy that we can, um, you know, more so than changing the auditor, uh, make sure that the process to have a fair selection um, and a selection that uh, the city of Portsmouth can be confident in uh, was followed. Um, that's what matters here. Uh, the fact that we have a new auditor, uh, I'm sure will be uh, noteworthy um, after so many years, um, but what is fantastic is the process worked and, and the folks that are on the committee spend as much time uh, to do the hard work uh, as was required in order to get uh, get to this day. So look forward to that. We have a motion. We have a sample mo or a, uh, a second. And Kelly, could we have a roll call vote? Certainly. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Unanimous. <clears throat> All right. Um, Councilor Denton, you're up. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to motion to suspend the rules to allow Councilors Bagley and Cook to bring forward item 15C. Second. 
Um, sorry. Um, 15. At the outdoor dining, outdoor dining, outdoor dining section. section. Oh. That's right, because it's 15. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so their whole thing. All right. Yeah. I was looking in there. All right. Longest motion in the history right. of ever. Okay. Okay. It's getting late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll need a roll call on that. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylaw? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Um, right, Councillor Bagley and Councillor Cook. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, we come to you tonight with a motion um, based upon <coughs> discussions of the council in December and recommendations that were made to the council and further deliberations. Um, I, I want to ask a point of order before I go through this um, to the, the city clerk. Uh, do you need me to read out the entire motion or can I read the first part of the motion and refer to the, the motion in the packet? You can refer to the motion in the packet. Okay. Thank you. you <clears throat> <laughs> I move to adopt an outdoor dining policy in Portsmouth with the parameters outlined in the packet in sections A through F. Second. Any discussion? Um, I am going to move to make an amendment because we do have a um, typo in here. Okay. And I motion that under section D, parking loading zone outdoor dining shall have a permit fee of 1500 a space or five dollars a square foot which uh, ever is the lesser expense mm -hmm. we mistranscribed the ten dollars a square foot okay mm -hmm. i'll make that change okay i think i need a second second, second. and um I'll, I'll speak to the motion overall um uh, councillor cook and i spent a, a good deal of time with the city manager um she allowed me to talk with uh, parking director Ben Fletcher uh, extensively. So we spent about three hours last Friday going through um, a lot of parking details. And uh, what was determined using uh, Ben's formula from the previous year, because we've greatly reduced the outdoor dining season from the beginning of May to Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I believe it went from something over 200 days down to 141. The, the, in last year's, we had outdoor dining for 210 days and proposed for this year would be 143 days. Thank you, um, 143 days. And calculating the cost of a parking space using a fairly complex formula the parking director developed with this new time frame, instead of being $5,700 worth of revenue, would be $3,517 worth of revenue. Now that calculation is how much that space could potentially generate using uh, commonly accepted parking factors and data that the city has. However, it does not include, um, if somebody was about to park for $2 an hour in an on-street uh, space, and then they moved to say the foundry garage and parked for $1 an hour, um, you would recover half that cost. So the, the, the cost per space is 35.17, however, I would argue that it's actually probably not half that, um, but a little less than half that that we'd be losing. So if we were to approve these fees, um, I do not think the city would as a whole be losing any revenue. Um, to further back that up, in uh, from July to November of 2021, um, oh, I forgot the numbers. I, um, do you have them on your phone? Uh, just a second. Just as we're going down the, the path of, of describing that, could I ask what, um, it, it might make sense to send this to the fee committee since mm -hmm. we have a committee that decides what to do with fees and how to apply them. Okay. Councilor Cook. Um, Your Honor, well, I appreciate that suggestion. Uh, the fee committee is made up of two counselors that are here tonight 
and can help, I think, weigh in here as a council. We made the decision as a council last year. I don't see why we should change the process that we used before. Um, and I think, unfortunately, when it goes to the fee committee, fewer individuals at home are paying attention to the discussion we're necessarily having at the council. I think it's really important that we have this discussion here at the council so that people are, are aware of the discussions we've had. Sure, I, I guess I would, um, we wouldn't have the, the fee committee, the, the process would be we'd go to the fee committee, they would speak with staff um, and understand that from a fee perspective and then that recommendation would come back to the council where we would have that discussion again probably at the either the next meeting or the meeting to follow that. So it would still be a public meeting. We would just follow the process that we have of taking fees when it comes to fees since it's a policy. Just, I think it's a policy. It's kind of unclear because it's not an ordinance change. Correct. It would be it's, a policy. So it would be a policy. So it would be subject to the, at least as we stand right now, the fee committee when it comes to policy with regard to fees. Uh, Your Honor, I, I propose that maybe we um, discuss the, the research that Councilor Cook and I did tonight, and then uh, after we discuss the research and take the temperature of the Council, we could choose to either send to the fee committee or we could uh, vote on it tonight. Yeah, I mean, I guess it just seems like it jumped a step in terms of going through doing the research on the fees outside of the fee committee and then coming back well-intentioned, but we have a process that we have a fee committee where we send things in order to identify fees for services that we provide in the city. And so to, to have a, a separate meeting or a separate two counselors come up with something outside of that, um, happy to see all the research you've done go to the fee committee. Uh, along with these proposals, but I would imagine that this would go to the fee committee before it's voted on by the council. I, I do feel that when I brought this forward in December, uh, maybe that would have been the better time to recommend sending it to the fee committee before we commence with all the work. Certainly could have sent it then. Right. Yeah. Councilor Cook. Um, Your Honor, uh, is it reasonable to expect that two counselors could come to the fee committee and present, so therefore we would have four counselors present? Um, we might need to notice that for quorum if anyone else chooses to attend the fee committee for that discussion. Sure. We can do that. And can we discuss the other parameters of what we dis what we are proposing tonight? Because there's a, a lot in the recommendations that do not involve fees. Yeah. Um, we can get all this. It's late in the evening now. Um, so if I guess I I am happy to. Like, where do we want to start? Councilor Moreau? <laughs> uh, do you guys have examples of what roads, when you talk about the evidence of traffic flow below 1,000 cars, can you give examples of are there roads that have currently been used that would be less than 1,000 and which ones might be more than 1,000? Councilor Bagley? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, at the last meeting, I believe, uh, on Councilor Tabor's request, uh, Pleasant Street was somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,400 cars per day, and Fleet Street was in the neighborhood of 2,500 cars to, per day. Congress Street, I don't recall, but it was in the two or 3,000 range, and Hill Street was 40 cars per day. And I don't I think, think there's any other roads that would I, qualify. I think those are all of them, yeah. Guns mm -hmm. tomorrow. Uh, I would really liked the idea of a butter notices, especially the way we dealt with it in 2022. There was some recommendation about maybe even extending that to others. Um, would you consider actually adding some sort of a butter notice to this in the future as well? That's um, good. I think it's absolutely reasonable to follow the butter notice practice that we did 
last year when we had outdoor dining, we had a pretty robust process uh, discussing with the butters, especially if the outdoor dining space was going to extend beyond the frontage of the, the business that is having hosting outdoor dining. So we had that process. It was a very successful one. There was some negotiation that took place. I think it's reasonable to re continue with that process because it's not only familiar to the um, applicants, but it's also familiar to the abutters. And in that process, we had it, or the recommendation from former planning director, uh, Beverly, um, they recommended moving it to um, non-commercial as well. Is that the recommendation in this policy? No, it is not. Is no, that is not the practice that we had last year. That would be a change in practice for the upcoming year. Um, and I should note that that is just a recommendation coming forward. Um, but what that recommendation could do is it could effectively eliminate outdoor dining in many locations in downtown. So we have to be mindful of residents and part of being mindful of residents is obeying noise ordinances that we have currently on the books and enforcing our current noise ordinances downtown. Um, that's what we do to make sure that um, we don't disrupt the lives inordinately of people who live downtown. But we have to also be mindful that businesses need to operate downtown. And so we, we want to be careful that we don't um, we don't put ourselves in a position that it takes one person to complain and eliminate outdoor dining in three or four establishments. Now it's difficult because Beverly's not here, but was that the expectation of the um, of the uh, extending the butter notice uh, to uh, non-commercial entities as well? It was. Yep. I think it's ultimately the, the consideration, and I'm looking at the p a presentation that was given at the last council meeting, that staff would recommend the continuance of the programmatic requirement to, to notify abutters in the way we did last year, and um, if it were the will of the, the council to support it, to uh, include abutting residences as well. And the abutting residences would not be from a, well, <coughs> I guess it could be from anything, but it would. I think the examples were people looking to get into their building and right. things like that. That would be my understanding, <coughs> yes. Uh, Councilor Cook. Um, Your Honor, I think we have to be really careful when we use the term abutter. I will say that in, in my neighborhood, which is a pretty tight neighborhood, if somebody two blocks over does a project on their house, I get an abutter's notice. So you would have to be extremely specific as to each location, what defines an abutter at that location. And that would mean that we would have to do an assessment of every single business operation downtown and what qualifies as an abutter at that location beyond the businesses on either side. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, one of the uh, items in this motion, item F, which may potentially resolve some of this, the uh, city manager has the authority to act with notification of the council if any unforeseen circumstances occur or unexpected adjustments are needed. So to kind of echo Councilor's Cook concern, which is that if we use the word abutter and we include everyone that lives downtown, there's, it's reasonable to assume that some people don't like outdoor dining, so it may be impossible for any restaurants to get um, a waiver or a sign off. However, if we left it to the city manager's discretion for um, places where outdoor dining would have a a concrete conflict for some reason with a specific uh, resident um, that may be a workaround so I guess I was I was last time so just the level set the a butters notice were when you you had a crossed a threshold yeah you had a you had a right to do it in front of your business mm -hmm. and then to increase beyond your business you required an a butters notice and to, approval an approval to, to do so now it doesn't seem like it, I guess I'm not reading this correctly, that if it was an abutters notice to require to go out beyond your own business um, to have the buy-in of the, um, of the 
uh, the uh, abutting residential units as well because you'll be going into their spot or, or their space in front of the not just the restaurant where you can do it in front of your restaurant but in addition outside of of that so like one would one place might be sandwiched by uh, commercial uh, uses and and one might not be sandwiched by commercial uses so like how do we um, but it doesn't mean that 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 person that's uh, a, a residential use would have the same rights to say you know I don't want uh, this in front of my building I yes I think I understand what you're saying your honor and I think that makes sense but I think there's concern at least on my part that when we use the term of butter we might mean somebody on the third story above a street level established. I don't know what I guess my concern is I don't want to pass an ordinance that is um, so constrained that we eliminate outdoor dining um, in practice if not in theory okay. yeah. uh, Councilor Blaylock and Councilor Cook um, Thank you, I just feel like this is a really important subject and I don't see the rush on it I think it's kind of late right now to be talking of, of just this you know what I mean I, I think this is a People would like to see us talk about this. It's quarter of 11 right now. Um, I don't know if we're gonna, you know what I mean? I'm just trying to get the sense of um, if we're gonna be efficient on this, make smart decisions, if everyone's still awake enough, listening, we're performing at our best right now, or if we should table this. Councilor Tabor. Um, yeah, I was also curious as to whether the staff had recommendations about Market Square Day and I don't see any accommodation in this policy for Market Square Day in accord with those. And I also agree with Councillor Blaylock. Um, you know, we're going to get deeper into this, and um, it, I don't see that we have to vote this tonight. I think it could go through fee committee and come back the 23rd or even later. Assistant Mayor. Yeah, thank you. I would also echo the same sentiment. I think that. Um, as we look to set a policy for the third year now and, and look at potentially an ordinance for outdoor dining, I think that we have to make sure that we have a lot of public input. I know that last year when we had discussed this, uh, we had a plethora of emails and a, and a huge rally of community support. And I would love to be able to give those um, residents a chance to come and publicly speak more um, based on the suggestions that are written here um, by the two counselors and also other suggestions. Uh, my my own note is I was concerned not to see in writing the the restriction of size, um, as in in front of their own store their own storefront window space. Um, I think that that needs to be very clearly written, which it has been clearly written in the last, um, especially last year. So I think we need to make sure that um, there's there's a difference between being prohibitive and being protective of our space, and so I think that we need to we need to walk that line finely. The other, um, thank you, Assistant Mayor. The question I have is, last year, I'm trying to remember what we did with this. We had recommendations. We voted to change those recommendations for year one. Didn't we change it so it was a, a sliding scale that it went up each year? And these are the same as they were last year. There was discussion of, of increasing fees over time to the potential recommendation of what staff had which is why we reduced the outdoor dining season by about 60 days. So we're, we're, we're instead of asking for more money, we're giving them less time, which also returns the parking to inventory faster. So what we're trying to do is maximize the outdoor dining season to be when the most people want to be outside and make sure that we get the parking back in the winter months when people are less likely to want to walk. Um, during a, a nice summer day, people are typically more um, likely to walk a little bit further. Um, on a cold, blustery day in November, uh, it's a bigger ask to ask somebody to walk a couple minutes. I also have one more question, if I may, Your Honor. Sure. Um, about the language uh, in uh, letter C, um, it says existing or restaurants with existing platforms and surrounding designs for prior seasons will be grandfathered in with permission of city manager. All outdoor spaces shall have tables and separate chairs to allow for uniform accessibility. There are a few that um, I, I, I worry that that's a contradictory statement, that we are, we are grandfathering some in, but then also saying you have to have um, accessibility when we know there are some that would be grandfathered in that would not have accessibility. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it, 
I can think of one or two off the top of my head that were pre-done platforms that did not have full accessibility. So I, I would say grandfathered in as long as. I can answer that one. Um, actually, n none of the pre-done platforms that are existing that would be allowed under these changes are not accessible. So um, though there are only a few, I think, that we're talking about, I don't know that those are allowed given traffic flow um, with these changes. So um, that wouldn't be an issue. Um, the other thing that this uh, change requires is that um, restaurants build a platform to make their space accessible. Um, that you have to have accessibility. Um, so that is a change, and that was one of the recommendations that came forward, was um, to make it look more like, I don't know if you remember the images in December of the Rosa's dining space that had a platform that's accessible. So um, that's really the request that's coming forward, making sure that we're accessible. Now there, there is one space that I can think of that does have bench seating um, and has an accessible uh, platform space but they also have tables and chairs. So that space is accessible to someone who is in a wheelchair. Yeah. I, th I think one of our goals with this ordinance was to really make the outdoor dining locations more aesthetically pleasing. So as it has evolved, um, we've, we've started to put up guardrails to make it better and better looking. And some of the guardrails that we have in this ordinance may disqualify, um, I'm thinking of one place in particular that is particularly nicely done, um, but doesn't really follow the letter of the law here. So we don't wanna um, take a very accessible, aesthetically pleasing location and tell them that they don't quite follow these rules so they have to start from scratch. Um, but we do want these rules in place for the people that didn't put as much effort into building a platform and whatnot. Um, but we don't want to penalize the people that spent large sums of money early on a, let's say, a technicality. I mean, we also don't want to penalize people who can't afford to spend large sums of money on, on fancier platforms. So I, I, I just want to make sure that while we're looking at this and we look at an aesthetic reason, we, I, we always have to think about the other end too. I, just a point of clarification. So uh, point B says, uh, outdoor dining shall not encumber street <coughs> flow. Can you list list off those streets again for me? Yeah, so it would be the um, Pleasant Street. Yep. Fleet Street. Yep. And Congress. And if you want, I can give you the four restaurants. So we would not allow those by, by any means? If this were to pass without any amendments, that's correct. Okay. And what are those? It would be the Clipper Tavern. Yep. It would be the Franklin. Yep. It would be Jumping Jays and the Goat. And potentially, although I don't think they would bring it back, um, flatbread, because they didn't have it last year. So I guess I wonder where you are hidden on Congress, because doesn't Congress start? It's the turn lanes. OK, so you're talking it's about the changing. turn lanes. Yeah, it's okay. not parking it's spaces. It's changing the flow. OK. And then we have a second part that kind of addresses Congress, but that's more of a long-term plan. Yes, I like that plan. Councilor Cook. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to make it not cost prohibitive for those businesses that, that, that um, for those businesses that this is an expensive um, endeavor is by keeping the fees at $1,500 per parking space. Because if the fees went to, th to 3,000 per parking space and say you had two spaces, um, that cost is you know 6,000. If you lower the fees, they have the amount of money to build a platform and to make their space more accessible by using the difference between what the, the cost would be with the higher fee. So with the lower fee, um, you may get more aesthetically pleasing, more accessible outdoor dining space. Then I think that benefits everyone. And I guess, sorry, again, a, another point of clarification. If there are example, and I, I think in my head, say Moxie, they are accessible, with a with a rubber ramp that say you know uh, the navigators lovely gave out to restaurants would they be required to build a wooden platform? I ignored your uh, suggestion. Um, 
that's why we put the city manager discretion because there are a couple locations I can't think of where they are um, where the curb is so flush with the street that a platform would actually be counterproductive but what we want to do and, and the way I look at it, I'll speak individually as myself as a counselor is that and I've said this before the reason we did it was to save restaurants during COVID the reason I want to continue it and the reason the feedback I've gotten from residents on why they want to con continue it is they like the vibrancy of downtown so this is no longer um, an economic uh, safety net for restaurants. This is, uh, let's set the fees at a number that we think will have enough restaurants to participate to, to make it vibrant downtown. However, let's also set enough uh, regulations so that it's aesthetically pleasing. So what I'm trying to achieve here is a high level of outdoor dining um, at a cost that recoups um, I would say close to almost all of the city funds that we'd lose otherwise. Um, but I'm not looking to drive revenue in that sense. I'm looking to make our downtown more walkable, more vibrant. And I think requiring restaurants to really step up their game uh, aesthetically is, is a factor in that. It seems like it's difficult to require restaurants to aesthetics or they're, they're tricky. Um, but wouldn't it make sense to follow a if your point is that we want to lower fees so that they invest in your in good good uh, fancy looking outdoor dining wouldn't we just keep the fees the same and figure out or raise the fees and figure out a way to incentivize by discounting a X percentage of the fee, if it went into beautification, provable, demonstrable beautification of that, instead of trying to grandfather in, and then also create a uh, a lower fee um, off the jump, but then require potentially more money to be spent in terms of platforms. I know Councillor Denton's had his hand up for a while, but I'll, oh, if sorry. I could just real quickly respond, Mayor, before we jump over and. and Councilor Cook and I and the, the city manager spent a lot of time on this, and you're absolutely correct. It's very difficult to come up with a, you should make this look better somehow. And this is kind of what we came up with, but I think it's also good that we're having the discussion here tonight because that may be a more effective way to do it, but I, I had not considered it. Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook? Um, the only challenge with doing it that way and in incentivizing is that you're essentially punishing the people who already invested that kind of money up front because they can't get a discount. Um, because they're not building a new platform or they're not doing anything differently than they did in the past. Um, so I think that we have to be really careful. I also think that, and I think that this is really important, we've received feedback from restaurants and not just our small restaurants that are owned by individual families, but other restaurants that if the fee goes up, they will not do it again. And if the goal is to have outdoor dining, um, we want to encourage it, not discourage it by raising fees. I think the goal across the council, at least I'd be surprised if it wasn't, is to have outdoor dining. The goal, at least my goal individually, is to make sure that we have it in a way that's sustainable uh, for our downtown and that everybody is, you know, it's not pitting or the sense of, you know, uh, one industry over the other. I think restaurants, provide an enormous amount of benefit to the downtown there what we are known for um, what brings people in um, but certainly want to make sure that we are balanced towards uh, the you know the mosaic that is the downtown um, you know that's why it, would, it seems like to me by if we were to put this uh, to the I mean all of these things are interesting and good, but interrelated in terms of the fees. And if we could hear from the fee committee, in addition to the work that you guys have done outside of the fee committee when it comes to fees, I think you would be following the process of our council uh, as well as we've currently constructed it uh, and provide another opportunity uh, for us to have a dialogue on this at the following council meeting. But, Councilor Denton. Thank you, Honor. Um, I would actually like to offer two amendments to this. The we first one's on the floor. Yeah, we have, yeah, so we have an amendment. On the floor. Uh, What's the current amendment? To 
to change from the square foot from, from 10, 10 to, five. to 5. Oh, yeah. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Mayor, <clears throat> I'd like to echo um, Councillor Beckstead. Uh, Beckstead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Layla, <laughs> um, it would be great to have people here on this discussion. It would be great to not have it at 11 o'clock at night um, because I think this is a, a subject that is of great interest to many people. Um, and I, I'm a little disappointed to have this continued discussion out of the public. Councillor Bagley? Um, I, I mean, I, I would say we're in the public right now, but you're right. There's probably not a lot of people watching this <laughs> yeah. late at night. Um, if Councillor Cook agrees, uh, I would withdraw our motions and make a motion that we refer this to the fee committee with the invitations of Councillor Cook and Bagley. Any other discussion? Or is oh. that second? What do we do with the current motion on the floor? If it was like withdrawn, which was withdrawn. Okay. Um, with a slight amendment, mm -hmm. with a report back from the fee committee at the next council meeting. Do we have enough time in the calendar to hold a fee committee meeting before the January 23rd council meeting? It's not too easy. Is that, is that Councilors Tabor and Denton? Yes, yes. that's the... Uh, it yes. may, okay. We need an in-person quorum it may depend on when Councillor Tabor can come back. Right. We can we can work that offline. All right. And if I may, I just want to speak to the. I'm not going to make the amendments, obviously, but just so people know what they were going to be. The um, first one would have been to paragraph D. So there's no real reason to write this down. I was going to add a sentence which would have read. Outdoor dining that is not in a parking slash loading zone or on sidewalks will have a permit fee of $5 a square foot. The reason for that was going to be D only covers parking slash loading zone outdoor dining and sidewalk outdoor dining. However, B would allow for outdoor dining like there is on Hill Street. So by the addition of that sentence to D, it would allow outdoor dining to continue on Hill Street. So that's going to be one of the recommendations. The other recommendation is actually to paragraph D and uh, paragraph B. Uh, this relates to the uh, street flow of traffic. And again, just letting people know. So at the end of that first sentence, which reads, outdoor dining shall not encumber street flow of traffic in the high traffic zones of the downtown area, I was going to add except in areas where the city is currently considering permanently changing the flow of traffic. Um, reason for that is uh, for those that watch the Parking Traffic and Safety Committee, they are, they did get a report back on changing the flow on Fleet Street. They're not ready to make their recommendation yet to the council, but the direction it seems to be going in would be keep the, um, from the fresh press side of Fleet Street, close to court, two ways, but making the uh, Gilly side of Fleet Street one way and by adding that single sentence in here since it's already under consideration I think it would make sense to allow outdoor dining to remain on Fleet Street where it's <coughs> going to become one way because it's one way now we're considering it if we keep flip-flopping it wouldn't necessarily work I think it would just make sense to keep it but again these are just things which I guess I'll talk to you when it comes back from the B committee. Councilor Murrow? I just think we need to make sure that we're conscientious that whatever we do pass takes into account for all of the neighbors. I mean, we had that complaint about Vaughn Mall and one business owner whose business went greatly down because no one could really get to their front door because of outdoor dining. So whatever we do put in, I think we need to make sure we're conscientious of all the businesses and that everything is equally put out there. Mm -hmm. Any other Comments? Motion on the floor is to move to the fee committee. Uh, it's to. Um, With the invitation of yes. Councillor Bagley and uh, Councillor Cook with a report back at the next city council meeting, the 23rd. If possible. Correct? That's correct. Okay. A roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? 
Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Unanimous. All right, so we're back to Councilor Denton. I move for all members of the City Council to be given municipal email addresses for official business. Second. So I'll speak this real briefly for the five out of the seven years I've been on the City Council. Um, our email system has been a little outdated and I've missed a lot of them. I know that now the City has the opportunity or will soon have the opportunity to have more email addresses available and that Mr. Mayor, you've been piloting the uh, uh, city councilor having an official email address, and I would like to see all of us be afforded the opportunity when if they are available. I think that's a great idea. Okay. And I think hopefully we can improve the email all function of uh, the city uh, email all councilors with the addition of a, like actual uh, municipal emails. I do think that we are transitioning to a dot gov, though. So Correct. it might be um, a couple weeks before that happens. Your Honor, it will actually be in the March April time frame on, according to our CIO. <laughs> okay. A couple months then. That's, that is fine. Right. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, can we have a roll call vote? Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McKechnie? Yes. Unanimous. All right. Now, Kelly, am I able on these approval of grants and donations to make a motion to accept all of the remaining? If you choose to do that, we can certainly do that. Okay. As long as it's so. outlined. I will await a motion uh, to approve the donation uh, to the tree fund from Judith A. Seven for $25, the donation to the fire department from Paul Gormy and Kimi Aguchi for the discretion of the fire department, $2,500, and the donation to the senior activity center from Ann Oki uh, for senior luncheon funds in the amount of five thousand dollars so moved. moved second we have a roll call vote yep. assistant mayor kelly yes councilor Tabor. yes councilor denton yes councilor moreau yes, yes. councilor bagley yes Councilor <coughs> lombardi yes Councilor blaylock yes Councilor cook yes mayor mckechnie yes, yes. Is there anything under miscellaneous? Okay. Councilor Bagley. Just uh, very quickly, thank you, Your Honor. In, uh, in, in regards to, uh, I guess, what we'll call Top Hat Gate going forward, um, I grew up in a Unitarian Universalist church, however, not the South Church here in Portsmouth. And in the Universal, uh, Unitarian Universalist church, uh, we were kind of encouraged to wear ball caps, lapels, festive av uh, uh, outfits, even on Sunday church service. So um, I uh, deeply apologize if I offended anybody by wearing a uh, festive outfit to a festive event at the church. That was not a church. Okay, thank you, Councilor Bagley. Councilor Lombardi. Uh, yeah, I would um, like to get a follow-up um, report on the negotiations for the uh, water line uh, crossing uh, private property. Oh. Oh. Durham? Mm -hmm. Durham and next, the next meeting would be fine, but sure. all right. Anything else? All right. Um, we're going to move to adjourn, and uh, and Councilor Tabor is going to leave before, so we can say uh, all in favor. Aye. 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 Good night, Portsmouth. <laughs>